Welcome back, everybody. Joe Evers, defense expert. So glad to see you guys. It's been a couple of weeks since uh, we've done one of these live Q and A's. Been kind of a busy season, to be honest with you. But I'm back. I'm here to talk. So, what have we been up to lately? I say we a lot. Laurel, we, I suppose. What have I been up to the last couple of weeks? Why didn't we do one of these live Q and A's last week? We had this event called Wing of Palooza here in Springfield, Missouri. So I'm a part of this. Uh, men's service group, I guess you'd call it, called uh, Springfield Sertoma. We raise money for area kids' organizations, such as Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Boys and Girls Club, Diaper Bank of the Ozarks, to name a couple of them. Uh, anyway, we had a big event last weekend called Wing Palooza. One of the biggest events of the year we put on. We raised roughly about $100,000. So, uh, yeah, I thought it was worth taking a Saturday off from you guys and the Q&A and go and help raise a little bit of money. But now that that's over, we're back, ready to chat with you guys. So, without further ado, let's see who else here. First up was Brent Mitch. Brent, how are you, buddy? It's been a little while since I've seen you in the chat. It's good to see you again. Here in waiting. Thank you, sir. California boy there. Michael Bobbitt says, morning, Joe, from northern Michigan. Hello, Michael. Thank you for joining us. Project Metals here all the way from the U.K., Project Mel, I appreciate you. Always here every week. Much appreciated. Actually, uh, so we're putting together another live Q&A with some guys there in uh, Nottingham in the UK, D&J Projects. I think you'll enjoy that. I, I always enjoy talking with them for sure. Stephen, Stephen Finn. I almost said Stephen Wynn. That's not right. Stephen Finn. Hello from Northern California. Stephen, hello. Hey, Brent's from California. You guys, California's not that big of a place. You guys probably know each other, right? Martin Lee, hello from the UK also. Hello, Martin. We've got two folks from the UK. I should say, I guess, happy afternoon. Good afternoon to you guys. I think you guys are about six hours ahead. Chris Randbolt says, what's going on, guys? North Little Rock, Arkansas, right in my backyard. Hello, Chris. Welcome. Brent Mitch says, happy birthday to your little special person. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate that. Brent's from Monterey, California. That's right. I always forget exactly where everyone's from. So we got uh, Monterey and Northern California. We got two votes for California so far and two for the UK. So it's neck and neck. Love Dave and Stevie. I agree. DJ Project. So uh, Dave and Stevie, those guys are just incredible to watch i really do enjoy it. they have uh they have content twice a week they film day in the lifestyle which i think is incredibly interesting i mean gives you an insight into their day-to-day -day life what it looks like to work at dnj if you guys haven't checked out the channel you should most certainly do so really enjoy watching those guys chris olson's here hello chris from madison wisconsin all right so madison wisconsin we got northern michigan we got a couple from the uk a couple from california and Little Rock, Arkansas, right in my backyard. Guys, welcome. Thanks for joining us. If you guys have fence questions, if you have a subject that you'd like to discuss, drop that in the comments below. We've got a couple hours here to spend talking about everything fence and fence stain, really home services, to be honest with you. Uh, one thing I'm finding when I'm talking to you guys here, when I'm talking to other fence contractors, and then when I talk to friends with other home service-based businesses, roofing, heating and air, electrical, plumbing, that sort of thing, they're all kind of the same, right? It all comes down to customer service and communication. Of course, you know, doing what you say you're going to do and providing a quality product is always important. But communication is key. Whether we're talking about marketing, whether we're talking about, you know, service after the sale and, of course, service during the sale, communication during the project. But a lot of guys and gals focus on communication during the project. But they forget to communicate before the project. And most importantly, they forget to communicate after the project. I think it's incredibly important. We can certainly chat about that. Uh, one thing, too, I want to talk about is the subject about what are you selling, right? What, what are you offering? And so what do I mean by that? I mean, at Ozark Fence, we're not a fence company. I always, we have a monthly meeting actually coming up here in a few weeks, uh, final Friday of the month. Well, actually, final Friday of this month is we're going to be going for Thanksgiving. So it's actually the first Friday of next month. Irregardless. Regardless. 
Fridays. We have a monthly meeting. Uh, we get the whole team together. Uh, one thing I'd say each and every meeting, just to reinforce in everyone's mind, is that we are a customer service company that happens to build fence. And all of our decisions come from that motto, that saying, right? So uh, if if there's a question, the answer is, or well, the question I have back, I suppose, is does it lead to better customer service? And if the answer is yes, then we do it. And if the answer is no, we try to figure out what makes that answer yes. What can we do to make this a positive you know, customer service experience? How can we increase or push forward more, cu- more customer service? Um, but what do we sell? Those are fence companies. So natural reaction is we sell fence, right? Well, not necessarily. So one customer review that we, eh, it's probably been about a month ago, a month and a half ago or so we received. um, I'm going to paraphrase because I don't have it in front of me, but essentially uh, thanked us for providing a safe and secure backyard for his wife and their dog uh, to go out and enjoy, enjoy the outdoors. Right. So, Backstory is uh, when I talked with this gentleman, uh, so I talked to him when Sarah was on vacation, as you guys that follow the channel know, my sister Sarah runs her residential division, so she would normally take this few, this phone call, but uh, she's out on honeymoon. So I got the call, and I talked to him for a little bit about his project. Uh, he'd, he had submitted an online quote tool. Uh, we set up a time for me to call and discuss the project, and when I did, I learned – uh, you know, the question usually is, so, so why, why now what's spurring this decision to have a fence built right now, as opposed to not last month, not next month, why right now? Uh, he said, well, uh, so a couple of days ago, my wife was walking our two dogs just down the street and a uh, neighborhood dog, a dog that's been running the neighborhood for months, uh, that seemed friendly, uh, attacked them, uh, and actually, Unfortunately, uh, one of the, one of his dogs passed away. His wife was was fairly hurt, and the other dog was fairly hurt. So, um, yeah, they didn't feel safe. They didn't feel safe and secure. So we built them a fence. We built them an ornamental iron fence in their backyard. And now the review that he had given us was essentially uh, a nice picture of the backyard, which is always great from the customer's perspective. Um, but then also just thanking us for providing a, a safe and secure area for his wife and their uh, dog to go enjoy the outdoors in their backyard and safe safety and security. So uh, what do we do as a fence industry? We provide safety and security, right? So uh, the, the joke my granddad always used to say was the three things to keep a fence company in business are kids, pets, and neighbors. Uh, kids can be your kids or the neighbor's kids, keeping your kids in and the neighbor kids out. Uh, pets. Same thing, keeping your pets in or the neighbor pets out. Uh, and neighbors, typically uh, not the friendliest of neighbors or uh, maybe not the cleanliest, cleanliest, not the cleanest of neighbors. They don't keep their backyard squared away. So a lot of people don't want to see that. So uh, up goes the privacy fence, out of sight, out of mind sort of thing. So what what do we provide? Uh, safety, security, and peace of mind. And maybe, uh, maybe a little bit of backyard... Um, Backyard oasis, maybe, but safety and security primarily. Uh, I like to keep uh, kids and pets safe, so that's what we sell. I think that's a I think that's a worthwhile discussion to have with customers. Is you know, like I said, our our goal is to provide you an exceptional service, right? But also an exceptional result. So when you talk about when you talk to guys in you know, say the heating and air uh, industry. So they don't they don't tell you that they're going to provide except, exceptional service installing your unit and they're going to wire it up just right and they're going to program everything correctly. No, they say I'm going to make your house warm or cool, depending on the time of year. Right now it's a uh, frosty day outside, so the heating and air technician will say, "Hey, no problem. It's going to cost X amount of dollars, and I'll heat this house right up for you. You'll be warm in no time. How about that?" And you sign the work order. Right, because that's what you want. You want a nice warm house. Plumber, same thing. Hey, guess what? I'm gonna make your water work. Not I'm gonna replace your incoming water line and I'm gonna dig a hole that's you know two foot, three foot deep, and I'm gonna run all this new water line into your house or whatever they're doing. No, they say I'm gonna make the water work. You wanna take a shower? I can make that happen. You want to toilets to flush? I can make that happen as well. They sell the results, right? 
not necessarily the service, but the result. We need to talk about doing that as well. So for fencing professionals, like I said, we need to talk about, we provide safety and security, peace of mind, and we provide a really nice outdoor space for you to enjoy. If it's a wood fence that you can enjoy in privacy, right? So if it's fence staining, that we can protect that investment. That I mean, let's be honest. Fences right now are an investment. Even if you have a fence that's, I don't know, five, 10 years old, that maybe you still got a good deal on it compared to today's prices for fencing. Uh, but let's talk about the fact that that fence to be replaced today is incredibly expensive. So let's clean it up. Let's And then let's preserve it. Let's put a high quality stain on that fence. That's A, going to make it look great. So that's nice. Going to bring back a lot of that natural beauty to the fence. But also it's going to preserve your investment. It's going to make sure that you're not having to replace it next year or the year after when in fencing, I don't have a magic crystal ball, but I have a feeling fencing is still going to be incredible, incredibly expensive uh, next year and year after. That's what we're doing. We are providing results. So we should be leading with that. I will be providing you an exceptional backyard space. If I'm a fencing fencer, I will be providing you a safe and secure backyard that you can enjoy with your friends and family in privacy. If we're talking about wood fence. Um, that's kind of what's on my mind. I was uh, talking with another guy, another home service based contractor the other day. And that was, we had a pretty lengthy discussion around that subject that uh, we need to sell the results, not the service. Let's check in. Jason's here. The guys from Boulder, Colorado, tail end fencing, listening while we work. Welcome guys. Appreciate you tuning in. Let me know if you have a, a question that you'd like answered while you work. JB has a question. Thinking about cedar posts on pipe as Postmaster 8 foot steel posts not available in my area. Pipe is 24, pipe is 24 inches, cedar post portion seven foot, and cut is needed for six foot privacy fence. Okay. So uh the way I'm reading this, so round galvanized post, right? So this is what this sounds like. So postmasters aren't available in this area. Um so we installed we installed uh, wood fence on pipe posts for quite a while before. We got involved uh, ordering in Postmasters. Uh, if you can't get Postmasters in your area, you might be able to get one of the similar brands, uh, Lifetime Post, Gregory Post, come to mind. But uh, if those aren't an option, round steel is always an option. Now, typically, we would start at a, at a 40 weight. Now, why do I say 40 weight? Because you have CS40 and Schedule 40. Different products. Accomplished roughly the same way. So, my understanding is the difference between a CS or an SPS or a WS40 and Schedule 40 all comes down to carbon content. So in terms of a residential fence, well, or even a commercial fence, a six-foot wood fence, I think your results are going to be pretty similar between a, a CS, WS, SPS40 post and a Schedule 40. Um, it used to be that Schedule 40 was quite a bit more expensive than one of the other 40 weights. Now, not so much. So... Um, I think it's a viable solution. I really do. Now, um, really going to come down to your brackets. So some guys will use the Simpson brackets. We've used them in the past, had decent, uh, success with them as far as not slipping. Of course, if you do have concerns about the, uh, fitting slipping, you can always run a self-tapping screw through them and lock them in place. Um, yeah. So 24 inch pipe is 24 inches, cedar post portion, seven foot and cut is needed for six foot privacy fence. So. Uh, the way I'm reading that is you're going to set them 24 inches deep if you can. So you said the cedar post portion, the post portion is seven foot, and then you're going to cut it down as needed for six foot. I would rather see that post go a little bit deeper. Uh, so let me see. So, well, actually, yeah, okay. So then JB goes on to say live in the Pacific Northwest. Um, so Pacific Northwest is going to get considerably cooler in the wintertime, so, which means – your frost line is going to come into effect. I would Google frost line and then Pacific Northwest or more specifically uh, where it is in the Pacific Northwest you're from. See where that frost line is and go six inches deeper than the frost line. Uh, that being said, the ASTM standard is 30 inches. A post set would start, a post set, a post depth would start at uh, 30 inches and then go down from there. Six inches below the frost line. Uh, I would, I'm, I'm guessing your frost line is significantly deeper than 24 inches. Anyway, 
uh, six inches deeper than the frost line. And then, so your pickets will be, if it's a six foot wood fence, your pickets will be roughly 72 inches. Typically we'll, we'll leave a six inch reveal below that picket. So six inches from the top of the picket measure down will be the top of the two by four. So really you could get away with putting more of that post in the ground, knowing that you're going to end up cutting that post off anyway, rather than cut it off and pitch it. I'd rather have that post be a little bit deeper in the ground. Um, hope that helps. Best of luck with your project. See Wolf, what is up? Switch over from Facebook to YouTube. All right. Stain man. Kenny, how are you? Greetings from Texas, stacking lumber and listening to the show. I hope it's warmer down there where you're at. I always think about that when it's cold here. It's like, man, I hope those guys in Texas are warm because we're going through a little bit of a cold snap here in Missouri. It's like, well, I don't know. It's like 40 some odd degrees outside. It's not fun. It was 26 last night. Get out of here. JB says it's actually a cedar post that's cored out and the pipe portion is inserted in the post. Interesting. Okay. So, okay. Interesting. I don't know that I've seen that, JB. Uh, I mean, it makes sense. I mean, so you have the pipe post and then you have a wooden, um, guessing four by four, maybe six by six, it slides over that. That is certainly, I'll have to uh, see if I can't find a YouTube video on that and do a review because that, that certainly sounds interesting. So, and you would probably keep it from rotating in the same way that I talked about with the Simpson strong ties is you would run just a self-tapping screw uh, through the wood, through the pipe back into the wood, probably just lock it into place, keep it from turning would be my guess. Interesting. Jasmine Ruiz, Jasmine, I, I probably butchered that. I apologize. Good morning, Joe. I'm new to your channel and really enjoy all your content along with Matt. We recently opened our business in Illinois, Boundary Fence. Welcome. Appreciate you coming along for the ride. If you guys have any questions, drop that in the comments below. Ross line's 12 inches. That's interesting. Pacific Northwest. Okay. So, because hmm. here in Missouri, the frost line's right around that 24-inch mark. So, 30 inches works well for us. Regardless, ASDM standard is that the fence post starts at about 30 inches now. That being said, can you get away with 24 inches? Possibly, depending on your soil type. If it's really loose soil, you want to go deeper. If it's really rocky, 24 inches might work. Interesting to hear, you know, the Pacific Northwest is 12 inches. I suppose it must stay warmer there than it does here, which is surprising because we're right, right in the middle. Man, I don't want to hear this. Seawolf says we're going to hit a high of 75 here today. I don't want to hear it because I don't know what the high is here today, but it's not going to be 75. I can guarantee that. Michael Babbitt says, question, here in Michigan, frost is 42 inches. We've been drilling 42 inches, bell-shaped hole, and then float setting nine-foot post, three foot in the ground. Is there another or better way that you might suggest? I've been thinking about, I've been thinking more about driving posts. So, yeah, so a lot of the guys up north are moving to driving posts. So, and what they're finding is driven posts are less susceptible to frost heave, which makes sense. So, frost heave, when we think about it, is the ground freezing and pushing up that concrete slug or the you know the concrete that's around the post so frost gets under and then freezes and pushes up and then frost gets under and freezes and pushes up and all of a sudden that post that was securely set in the ground is now starting to rise every time it freezes and thaws right it freezes and thaws now a lot of guys such as yourself in the north prevent this by belling or making the bottom of the hole wider than the top of the hole so that now all of a sudden you've got this wedge that the frozen ground is actually going to hold that thing in place it's going to be a lot harder to move this slug of concrete up out of the ground whereas with a cylinder there's really nothing holding it in the ground right now some guys will they'll drill down a little bit further that way they leave about six or eight inches of soil above the post above that concrete uh, just to try to help lock that in place but Belling out a hole has is a time tested method. The guys in the north have, they they pioneered the belled post method, uh, but other guys are now trying driven posts. So with a driven post, you're losing a lot of that mass that the frozen ground uses to push up and heave that thing out of the ground. Frost heave is the term for it. So uh, makes sense. 
right, that you have less mass that that frozen ground is pushing up. Now, you'd still want that driven post to be deeper than the frost line. I mean, my thought is um, that ground is still going to freeze and push and freeze and push. So, granted, now you only have your post. You don't have the mass of the concrete. But I would still think frost heave would be would affect that post if it's not driven past the frost line. Um, but what you're saying is the frost line is 42 inches. We've been drilling 42 inches, float setting nine foot posts. So, which is absolutely sufficient. I, mean, float, I like the idea of floating the post too. That way it fully encapsulates that post in the concrete. Um, but if we're, if we're talking about driving posts, your frost line is 42 inches. I drive it deeper than 42 inches uh, just to prevent, again, the frozen ground from pushing that post around. All that being said, I think you should test it. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, Find some place to test it, right? So uh, I've got some rental houses here in town, and we use those rental houses as testing grounds for different methods that we're wanting to try out, specifically the driven post method. Um, what we found is southwest Missouri is incredibly rocky. We knew this, but what we're hoping is we could drive the post through it. It's chunk rock, right? So we're not talking about solid shelf rock. We're not talking about huge chunk rock. We're talking about rocks um you know roughly the size of cantaloupe or smaller so i think that big i mean not a basketball not a softball somewhere in between um but we tried driving them and what we found is roughly half the posts would reject or they would just stop driving uh within the first foot so which is obviously not uh, acceptable for a, for a po for a fence post so we ended up having to drill those anyway We'd get the rock bit out and drill down and just took a little bit longer, but it got the job done. But the end result was if we're going to have to have the auger on the truck anyway, if we're going to end up drilling half these holes, we might as well drill the other half rather than drive some and drill some. So testing, always important. I would uh, I would drive some, you know, or or if it's a friend or family that's having you build this fence, maybe you ask them if they're willing to be your guinea pig. Hey, I want to drive these posts. I'm going to attach a warranty to it. I mean, we're friends or we're family, so you know I'm going to make good on this if if we need to do something different on these posts. But could I use your project as a test project? So that's what I would do. That being said, there's a lot of guys that are having a lot of success with uh, driven posts up in the north. JB says, yes, they're used extensively in the Seattle area. The post is bolted to Schedule 40 pipe. Bingo. There you go. Um, I'm gonna check that out. I really am. I want to see. I want to see what that looks like. Could be you get the benefit of having a wood look, a more natural looking fence, right? But the rigidity, the stability of having that uh, schedule forty or forty weight pipe. I like that idea a lot, guys. If you're just tuning in, if you like this content, if you find this content helpful, hit that like button. It's a free way for you to support the channel, and it gives both Facebook and YouTube, no matter where you're watching, uh, positive signals that we're up to good work here. So, so far, there have been two people that hit that like button, and there are 21 people watching. 10% of you have hit that like button. Oh, three. We're, the uh, percentages are climbing rapidly here. William Foster from Flippin' Arkansas. What's up, William? I believe, uh, what is it? We met. Was that three weeks ago? Four weeks ago up here in Springfield. Hope everything's going well down in Flippin. I bet it's uh, I bet it's almost Christmas light. It probably is Christmas light time. If I remember right, you guys started with uh, carpet cleaning, went to exterior cleaning, but are also doing Christmas lights, which is smart, right? It's, those are verticals that are pretty closely related. Uh, maybe we'll get on that subject here in just a little bit. But hello, it's good to see you. Hope you and your son are doing well. Uh, we have actually cored cedar posts to be sleeved round, sleeved into round tubing pipe. It works quite fine. Also, on aluminum fencing to extend the length, since since our frost line here in Illinois is at 42 inches. Yeah, so the further north you get, the deeper that frost line gets. Um, that I, I really do like this idea. I don't know why it's not a thing here. So cord cedar post um, makes sense. So you'd probably put it on a, I don't know, a lathe maybe. Uh, what's the process you guys use for coring those posts? I'd like to hear about that. 
Lee Cotney, what is up? Arkansas Fence Pro from Hot Springs, Arkansas. What's up, everyone? Hello, Lee. So you and I had a conversation about uh, fence fittings from where you're getting them. Good news. We're getting those things launched. And uh, the numbers that you and I went over uh, at dinner there when you were up for the training event, um, we we can do better than the numbers that you were talking about. So uh, check out the online store, ozfence.store. OZ is in Ozark, then fence.store. Check them out. I can get them delivered to your door for less than what you're paying at the place you're buying them from. So you're actually on my list of people to email. I was going to go on to the registration from the training event, get your email, send you an email. Um, anyway, check it out. Let me know what you think. We can get uh, right now. I think what we've got loaded up on the online store is uh, tension bands, brace bands, rail ends, carriage bolts, loop tops, dome tops, tie wires. Hit them all. Rail ends. Did I say that one? We don't have tension bars. So, what we're learning is that shipping things can be tricky, um, especially things that are not normal size, such as a tension bar that's tall. It's 48 inches or 45 inches. Uh, but skinny, so they're odd shaped, right? So we're still trying to figure that out. Actually, there's a FedEx rep that's supposed to come by next week and help us figure this out. But for now, fence fittings for less than what you're probably paying elsewhere. OZFence.store. Adam Sims, what is up? Adam and I were just messaging uh, last night, I believe. Yeah, it was last night. This all blends together. But hello, Adam. Here's a question. When repairing old fence, what do you look for to determine if a post is bad or not? Obviously broken or obvious signs of rot. What else do you look for? <sighs> yeah, so you would have to really start there. Visually inspect the post. Is it broken or, you know, so what I'll typically do is I'll I'll just take my boots and I'll scrape down a few inches to see if we uh, expose any rot or insect damage, which rot is actually, organ you know, microorganism damage. It's not, anyway, see if there's damage to the post. And then I'll just, Give it a shake. I started with a general shake because I'm not want to be the one responsible for breaking this thing because then I've got to replace it in order for me to feel good about it. But or or shake the fence, right? So if it's a privacy fence, typically I'll push on the panels to see how much give that panel has. There's not a scientific way of doing that, right? I just know what a new fence should feel like when we when we shake it, what it how much give it should have. And if it has more than that, we should have a conversation about replacing those posts. Um, but it's tricky, right? So how do you test it without causing further damage? So what you're doing by shaking the post or shaking the panel is you're you're loading or you're putting a load on the fence and you're seeing how much support the structure pushes back against the load that you're putting on the fence. Um, how much load do you put on the fence without breaking it? You know, if this doesn't have a lot of structure there and you put a lot of load on it, if you give it a good hard shove and you break that post, well, now the customer is going to say, well, you broke that one. So, you know, I don't know. It, now you could, you could make the, you could make the argument. This thing was broken anyway. I don't know. <clears throat> yeah. So you start with obvious bro broken posts, obvious signs of rot. Um, Structural stability. So I run my hand on the, so again, we're talking about wood post, right? So run my hand on the top of the post. If I feel a lot of rot up there, then that tells me typically I'll feel the core of the post because a lot of times, a lot of times rot from the top down will start inside out. So I'll feel the top of the post and then it's a judgment call, right? So not a scientific answer, not a hundred percent answer, but that's what I do. So I hope, and I hope that helps. Adam's in the middle of uh, putting together for putting together price on a pretty big project. I wish you the best of luck with that, Adam. I really do. If I can be of more help, I don't feel like I was very helpful last night. Um, if I can be of more help, please let me know. Good morning, Lee. I agree, William. Billy Kennedy says from Canada, the great white North building the hole and leaving six inches works very well. I drove a poster the way to go. I have fully installed tennis courts in one day. Incredible. So uh, tennis courts are, I, I'd like to see that operation. So it's probably, probably using a piece of equipment. Um, so I tell you, Luke Gibson, uh, Farm Fence Solutions, has ProTech drivers that are absolutely incredible. I haven't put hands on one, but I watch guys at the Fall Fence Forum use those things. Wow. 
So those things, those pieces of machinery are incredible. So I'd have to think a tennis court would be installed with something to that effect. Uh, I'm guessing you're not using hand drivers on something that tall. But yeah, so so it's interesting to hear Billy's point of view that, like I said, belling the hole and leaving some on the top is a time-tested tradition. It works. The method methodology is solid on that one. Uh, but driven posts are the way to go. So Billy, I appreciate you weighing in and giving your experience. All right, we're up to seven likes and 14 viewers. 50% of you. Thank you. That means a lot. Ashley Roth, how do yourself? How do you do? How are you doing? Hope you guys are doing super well. Bill Terry. That's a name I haven't seen in a while. What's up, my dude? I haven't, I haven't talked to you. So, backstory. Brent and Bill. Uh, Brent Mitch, Bill Terry. I used to game with these guys. Never met them in person, but used to game with these guys all the time. Uh, Brent said he's over in uh, California. Bill's uh, to the north. He's he's a neighbor to the north. I don't know if he wants to say where he's from or not, but miss both you dudes. I need to, I guess, just make time and get on the PlayStation and join up with you guys. And yeah, you know, race a cane, race some cane with you guys. We used to we used to play. Uh, what do we play? Call of Duty. Nope, we played the SWAT game. Anyway, had a lot of fun with that. It wasn't any good, but I enjoyed talking with those guys. Alan Moffat says, probably off topic, but I'm erecting a fence down both sides of a back garden, and both neighbors have expressed their dislike of seeing the back side of the fence. What's your thoughts on neighbors like this? Do you go out of your way to appease them or just get in and out? Up to the customer, right? So <clears throat> here... This is an interesting discussion to get into is which side should that fence face? Because one thing we have learned in the comment section of some of these videos is that there are strong feelings one way or the other on which side the smooth finish side should face an offense. Uh, actually, a comment came in this morning. Let's see. Let's read this thing. It's, it's not a, it's not a bad comment, but it illustrates it illustrates what I'm talking about. So uh, let me start here. In our area, in the Midwest, Springfield, Missouri specifically, uh, if we if the customer doesn't have a preference, uh, we typically face the smooth side out towards the neighbors away from the customer. Uh, I made mention of this on one of the videos a little while ago, and I was informed that that was incredibly wrong. It was a disservice to our customers, and we were robbing them, which I felt was interesting. but. Nonetheless, uh, that the, their, their position was the smooth, the smooth side should always face the customers. Um, that, that giving the customers the structure was uh, robbing them and really giving them a disservice. In their region, in their area, I'm sure that's true. Here, the standard is the smooth side faces out. There's actually some neighborhoods. Uh, there's two here where the covenants and restrictions actually require that the smooth side face away face out from the property we did another video um this one was uh is april wilkerson's horizontal horizontal fence if you don't follow april you should she's got a lot of cool tools i'm jealous of her shop uh you should check her channel out april wilkerson anyway she did a she did an eight foot tall horizontal fence where the smooth side the finished side uh more faced her than the neighbor now, I say more face her because they actually uh, ran rails between the posts. So, yeah, it's either, either here nor there. Uh, but I had a comment this morning come through, well, 10 hours ago, so midnight-ish. Um, looks like this fence is possibly illegal and could cause problems down the line if the next-door property sells. She put she put the egg, ugly side facing the neighbors illegal. I don't know if... She lives in Texas, so I have a feeling there's nothing illegal about building a fence in Texas. See, Texas seems to let you do uh, what you want to do within reason, right? There's not a lot of uh, stuff like that. Uh, which side does the fence face? Litigation going on. But it illustrates the point, right? Okay, so let's get let's dig ourselves out of this rabbit hole. Uh, right to fence both sides, and neighbors have expressed their dislike of seeing the back side of the fence. Is it your, um, Alan, I'm probably not reading this. Is it your backyard or is it a client's backyard? Irregardless, um, whoever's paying for that fence 
typically in my neck of the woods gets to choose which side that smooth side faces. Now in my yard, I face this. We replaced my fence. What was it last last summer or the summer before? We face the smooth side out. I like smooth side out. It's a nice look from the road. It gives it's kind of a neighborly thing to do. Also, there's no ladder for someone to climb up and get in the backyard. Now it's a six foot fence. I I'm under no illusion that this is a security fence, but one less thing for neighbor kids to climb up and come jump on the trampoline. That seems to be a thing. Um, what are your thoughts on neighbors like this? Do you go out of your way to appease them? Not necessarily. I mean, do we try to? Of course. But if the neighbors are saying, hey, I want you to turn that fence around because I don't want to see the structure, you should talk to our client. You should talk to your neighbor. And uh, This is the way, you know, one of the, one of the things we talk about during the pre-construction interview, the, walk, the project walkthrough, is which side are we facing these boards? To me, to the pro, you know, nine times out of ten, it doesn't matter. Now, if it's going up against an existing fence, or there are some reasons, or there are some situations where we don't get to choose which way this fence faces. It's going to face one way or the other. Um, but it's up to the customer. So anyway, so we're going to ask the customer which way do you want these boards to face? Out is more normal here in our area. But you can also face them in. You can also see the nice side of the fence. You're the one paying for this. You get to choose. Um, and we might mention it. Hey, your neighbors mentioned they don't like this. Now, depends. So what we have done is we have on fences that are installed with steel posts. So we know there's enough you know, structural integrity there to hold up a heavier fence. We'll go run pickets down the other side of that fence You know, to, for the neighbor. We'll let the neighbor know. Well, if you'd like to cover up that structure for X dollars while we're here, we can do that. I can call the office, have some boards brought out. We can finish that side for you for X dollars. Um, but that's really going to be the that's really going to be the accommodation there, right? Especially after once we've begun, which is what it sounds like. Um, sounds like you're already in the middle of this project. So I don't know. You just tell the customer, you tell the neighbors it is what it is. Not a great customer service answer. I understand. But the customer in this situation is the one putting in the fence, right? So sometimes you have to pick and choose who gets the customer service answer. And it should probably be your client. Michael says, excellent advice. Thank you. Also thought I'd tell you, just got an airless sprayer. Great choice. And stained my first fence. You stain and seal expert, semi-transparent cedar color stain. Also a good choice. Uh, it looked awesome. It was actually pretty easy to clean up any overspray. It's actually pretty easy and clean up of any overspray was simple. Thank you for bringing them in. I absolutely, uh, you're welcome. I absolutely agree. So how did I find stainless steel experts? Well, stainless steel experts came, we, I came to them when we were, we've been building fence for three generations, right? So my, my granddad and his brother-in-law started this company. Then my dad bought it. Then I bought it. We've been doing fence for a while. But we realized staining fences is a natural add-on, right? It makes sense to offer fence staining to our existing clients and our and our new clients. So I started looking at what stains were in the market. Ordered a, ordered a five-gallon bucket from someone else who is predominant in the marketplace. And brought it in because they do a lot of um <clears throat> a lot of advertising and a lot of um demonstrations at fencing events so i brought a i brought a bucket in from one of our suppliers and the first impressions of this thing now i knew nothing about staining we were just gonna figure it out right pop the top off i cannot explain what these chemicals smell like but they're not great they don't smell safe so I started doing more research. Uh, I got tagged in the Stain and Seal uh, Experts University Facebook group. Um, and it was, it was off to the races from there. Um, so through watching his videos, I got to know Caleb. Uh, similar to this, I would suppose, where I hadn't actually met him, but I'd watched his YouTube videos and I followed his Facebook lives. And so eventually I reached out and said, hey, I would like to try your stain. 
Um, what, where, what, I believe the question I had, the first question I'd ask is like who your preferred vendor is. Like we like to set up an account or bring it in from them. I, I've asked around of our suppliers carry it. Um, he's like, I'll just send you a bucket. How about that? And you just let me know. And then, but when you're staining your first fence, he said, do you have a fence you can stain? Yep. So I've got a rental house fence. We just built six foot privacy cedar on steel need stained. Want to make sure that thing stays nice. And I said, all right, well, just FaceTime me when you're staining it and we'll go through that. I'll, I'll send you some stain and uh, to stain that fence and FaceTime me and I'll just walk you through it. You want to talk about the customer service answer. Uh, Ashley and Caleb are both incredibly customer service minded. Um, they are, they are the kind of people you would love to be friends with. You know what I mean? They're just legitimately good people. Um, yeah. So I just came to know them. And then, um, we, we've used her stain for several years and I started this channel and one thing led to another and, and Caleb had reached out to me, said, Hey, let's have a conversation on if it makes sense for, you know, stain and seal experts to sponsor the channel. And here we are sponsoring the live streams. Ashley, I know you're watching Caleb. If you're watching, thank you guys. Your friendship means a lot to me, uh, with or without the sponsorship. I appreciate the sponsorship as well, but I appreciate your guys' friendship more. So, so Michael. You've now experienced firsthand what I experienced the first time I used their stain. Uh, to your point, it's easy to use. It's also easy to clean up any sort of overspray off of AC units or concrete sidewalk that goes through the gate or what have you. Um, yeah, I enjoy it. That's the reason. It's a really long-winded story on why they're a sponsor, but they're a sponsor because I love using their products, and it makes sense to introduce them to you guys um, because they're somebody – I love doing work with. And if I like them, I have a feeling you guys are going to like them too. So yeah, uh, guys, you guys are, you guys are amazing. We have 11 likes and 13 people watching. That's over 50%. I'm not a mathematician. I'm a fence guy that does like some technology stuff. Um, that's over half. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Alan says just a fun one. What's the weirdest thing you found digging out a post? I found a, I found a bullet last week. <clears throat> okay. That's that probably wins. Um weirdest thing I've found. Um, so you find here in our area, you find a fair amount of um oh arrowheads, like stone arrowheads. Uh those are interesting to find. Um, what's the weirdest thing I found? I don't know, man. I'm gonna think I'm gonna I found the coolest thing I found was a uh, glass jar that was like what was it dated? I don't even know, but it was like a hand blown glass jar. Um ha, how we pulled this thing out or how we found it without just crushing it, I don't know. It wasn't very big, it was probably less than the size of your fist. It was kind of a smaller jar. Um, washed it out, like that that is incredible. Weirdest thing. I haven't found a lot of weird stuff, Alan. I don't, I don't know. A lot of arrowheads, which are, those are cool. I, I enjoy finding those. Um, just thinking through the process of making a stone arrowhead um, with the tools that were available at the time. That's interesting. I really enjoy finding that. I don't know. No weird stuff. I hate to disappoint you, but I don't know. I guess you could, I, unmarked utilities are kind of weird. Uh, you pull up, <laughs> We pulled up. Now this is back back when fiber optic was first a thing, and and when you hit a fiber optic line, they had to replace it node to node or whatever those. I think they're called nodes from one end to the other. You couldn't splice them in the middle. Um, we found we found a pair of those those that were I don't know how big was that. It was probably 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 basketball size. Like it was it was a main like fiber trunk uh, that was feeding uh, the southern part of Springfield south of this interstate. Uh, James River Freeway, if anyone's familiar, um, they they gave us the all clear, said nothing's in conflict on this property. We asked for the whole property to be marked. They couldn't be bothered, so found that. Uh, that was kind of weird, but I get I get what your question is on. I don't know. I haven't found any weird stuff. It's kind of it's kind of a boring answer, and I apologize. Matt Warner, you're kidding me. Driving through New Mexico, listening to my friend Joe. Well, my friend, Matt, thank you for listening. I appreciate that. Hey, let me know if you got my email. So I want to get Matt on this show 
I have all the questions. So, so those of you that came to the training event what was it, about a month ago uh, here in Springfield, you got to listen to Matt. Or if you've if you've attended really any of the Standing University events in the last year, uh, you've heard Matt speak. I love sitting and being a student of Matt Warner. I really do. So, so Matt, you'll get a kick out of this. I was going to send you. I was actually going to send you a text after this. So we just got done loading in a couple deep freezes uh, downstairs. Um, two reasons. One, so we had Wing of Palooza, which was a big uh, wing um, event, like a, a different restaurants and corporate teams come together with their own wing sauce, and they compete to win prizes for like best traditional and best hot sauce and stuff like that. We fry a bunch of wings. We fry like thirty or forty thousand pounds of of wings up for this. Anyway, raise money for kids. Raise about a hundred grand. It was a good day. Uh, anyway, we have a lot of wings left over. Though. Excuse me. A lot of wings, a lot of chicken left over. So uh, to help them out, help them out and help the team out, uh, Sean would call that a win-win or a win-win-win. I forget what he called. It's take care of your team plus one. So we're going to buy this. We, Ozark Fence, is going to buy this chicken and put it in the deep freezes we just bought and then give it out to our guys. Because I remember my buddy Matt Warner telling me a story about how um how they pass out they have they have a giving day i forget what you guys call it but it's a day where where you give out beef to your to your guys so i i i thought about that and then this opportunity came along is like this sounds like that so we're gonna buy a bunch of chicken give it to our guys but what do you do with the deep freeze once you have it you fill it full of beef so that's what we're gonna beef and chicken and whatever i can find good deals on we're gonna fill this thing up with meat and it's gonna it's gonna be a take one take one as you need it sort of thing. Uh, we're coming into Christmas time, Thanksgiving. I'm gonna buy a bunch of turkeys, put turkeys in them, give them to the guys. Uh, but I want to turn this into like a I don't know what the what we'll think of a good term for this. But um, yeah, yeah. So if guys are you know if it's getting towards the end of the month and the funds are running out and and uh, they still need to feed those kiddos or feed themselves or feed some friends or if they know someone who's who's needing a food. We're going to have a deep freeze full of beef and chicken for them to go pull some out of. And, uh, yeah. So anyway, Matt, I thought of you, I thought of you when, when this opportunity came, I thought, you know what, Matt, Matt told us about the giving day that he has with his guys where he buys a bunch of his family's beef and, and passes out to his uh, team and their families. And then he keeps them on hand for, for the ones that need it. And I thought, you know, my family might not own a bunch of beef, but I bet I can find a butcher that butchers beef and will sell it to me. So we're going to call that the uh, Matt Warner experience for sure. Craig Armula, I applaud every time I say this. I'm sure I butchered it. Craig, welcome. Good morning from New Jersey. Craig's here almost every week. Thank you, good sir. All right, <laughs> Bill Terry's from Vancouver, British Columbia. I didn't know. I don't want to like out people in case they're like don't want people to know where they're from. Bill Terry's from Vancouver. Go, Bill Terry. Good morning, Joe from Oklahoma. Good morning, Nathan. Speaking of somebody we're going to have on the show, I'm going to talk to Nathan about sales. Uh, he he and I, actually, I was in a in a group, was it two years ago maybe, at a, the AFA Midwest meeting, and he made a comment uh, about salespeople um, that has stuck in the back of my mind. So, I reached out to him. I'm going to be sending Nathan. I'm going to be sending you a scheduling link to have you come on one of these ask the experts. Cause I've got some questions for you about building a successful sales team. Cause I think you've got that uh, pretty well figured out. Oklahoma. He only a couple hours away. Chris rainbow says, is there ever an appropriate time to mix mineral spirits and stain and seal expert stain more specifically for a new fence or wood? Chris, uh, that'd be a great question for Caleb. When I, I would be hesitant to thin it down much more than it is only because it's formulated um, to that formula. Does that make sense? That probably didn't make sense. Uh, don't use a word with itself. So it is made for that specific formula, right? So they've put a lot of time and effort into the formula. The chemists have come together and helped build this formula or bless the formula. So I don't know that I would mix a lot of mineral spirits with it. So I'm mixing mineral spirits would make it thinner is where my mind goes on that subject. Uh, I wouldn't want to thin it out much, honestly, especially new wood. So new wood is going to uh, soak up more. I mean, it hasn't 
it hasn't been introduced to stain yet, so it's going to have more mass. It can soak up that stain. There's no stain in it right now, so I don't. I don't think I would. I don't think I would thin it out. Now, that being said, we're going to be having Caleb on here in the next couple of weeks. Actually, we need to sort that out because the, he usually comes on the last Saturday of the month, but that's going to be Thanksgiving, the weekend after Thanksgiving. We'll probably still have this a bit. Yeah, sure. It'll be two days after Thanksgiving. I'll still have it, but we need to ask Caleb. Actually, actually, if you're watching, if you could pipe in, uh, is there ever an appropriate time to mix mineral spirits with stainless steel expert stain? I don't think so. I've tried it. Now, let me talk. Here's why I tried it. So we we were... Uh, we had bought a pre-staining machine uh, that you rolled boards through while it sprayed stain on, and then it had uh, paint rollers that would then essentially back brush it, the stain, into the board and slick off the excess stain. Mechanically, it worked very well. The problem, the problem is it was made for um, a different fence stain brand who um, their stain's thinner. Right. So less pigment, uh, the base is different. It's a thinner stain. So when you introduce stainless steel experts, which is a thicker stain and, you know, it's more viscous and it has more pigment in it, uh, it was clogging up more. So what we were finding is we were trying to get, we were trying to get the stainless steel experts stain a little bit thinner. Uh, we'd worked with Caleb and, and he had said, well, I, you could try doing this. Right. So we tried adding mineral spirits to it. It did thin it out. The problem is then the application, <coughs> excuse me, the application just, uh, it wasn't consistent. The the machine, and I don't know if it was the machine or thinning out, we thinned out the stain too much, which is more likely to get it to work in this machine. Um, not a positive experience thinning out uh, stain cell experts with mineral spirits because like I say, they've had, they've had chemists that, created this formula that blessed the formula and so when you start messing with it it starts messing with the results too i hope that helps lee coney good morning i think we, we already said good morning lee oh lee saying good morning to william because william said good morning to lee on board understood sea wolf says i have a deep freezer it will it flash freezes all my yellowfin Oh, I, this is Brent Mitch. Okay. I had, it, it took me a second to, yeah, got it. Brent. Yeah. So I love to live vicariously through Brent's YouTube page. So you should follow Seawolf if you like, you know, it's not fencing content. It's just exceptional, like diving content. And he uh, goes spear fishing. Actually, he has been known to send me some seafood and it is freaking delicious because it's fresh and it's freaking good so anyway i now have uh what are these things i now have like 20 cubic yards or 24 cubic yards of deep free space it's a lot more than i thought it would be but more people to bless so uh anyway unfortunately we don't have any yellow tuna yellow tuna yellow tuna yellow tuna or yellow fin uh in the lakes here or rivers so i won't be filling my deep freeze with yellowfin but we're gonna fill it up with beef chicken what else probably some pork i don't know i should probably i should probably pull the team and see what everyone likes eating i'm a big fan of beef and specifically tri-tip i am a huge fan of tri-tip tri-tip beef all right guys we're caught up on the comments i don't know that we've ever been ca caught up this quick we're highly efficient today. We're getting stuff done. We're going down less rabbit holes, probably. So we're an hour in, which means we got an hour and a half left to answer your questions. You guys are crushing it on the likes. Thank you. If you haven't liked it yet, please consider doing so. Maybe you get crazy and, and give it a heart. I don't know. So let's see. Will it tell me who's doing it? Like We've got two hearts. So thank you. Appreciate that. Likes and hearts and all of those interactions are, I think they're all the same to Facebook and YouTube. Well, actually on YouTube, you can't give hearts or shocked faces or anything or wow. So I think are what they call those. Anyway, their interactions and their engagement and they like it a lot. Facebook and YouTube like that a lot. So if you haven't had a chance, go ahead and do that. If you're new here, let us know you're here by saying hello in the chat. Also, 
If you have a fence or a service-related question, drop that in the chat. See how many more rabbit holes we can go down. Also, if you watch to the end, or if you leave and come back, that's perfectly fine too. Uh, we're going to be reviewing this week's video that we'll be launching here in a couple hours. I think it launches at 1.45 is when it's scheduled to go live, but you can watch it here first. We were doing this uh, We were doing this before, and then I stopped doing it for whatever reason. But we're bringing it back. So, anyway, I got it preloaded. I'll give you guys a sneak peek. Are you ready for it? So, this is going to be the video. The ultimate fence cleaning video. That is not a flattering picture of me. I'm going to talk to Jeremy about this, about the lenses he uses or something like that. Anyway, uh, so what it is, is we've been doing some fence cleaning videos. Uh, Caleb and his team, Caleb and Ashley and their team, uh, sent some cleaning chemicals my way. So we create a video. And anyway, so this is the video. So we've been using, I was trying to do a DIY method, right? So in my mind, that meant that we were going to use a, a garden hose with a sprayer attachment, maybe to get a little bit more pressure out of it. Uh, this fence absolutely defeated that idea. So as you can see, like there is a, there is a bit of organic growth. I didn't think it was that much though. I thought that that would just clean right off. It did not. Well, it did. I mean, you can kind of see the bottom half of that in the uh, bottom right-hand corner. It did okay. Uh, I think I said in the video that uh, if we were going to use a darker, you know, semi-saw, like a, I love walnut. Walnut's one of my favorite dark colors by Sand Sale Experts. If we were using a walnut, the bottom half of that would absolutely be acceptable. Let's see if we can... See if we can find, okay, that's a better picture. <laughs> so the bottom half of that would be acceptable for a walnut stain. I don't know how, how clearly that comes through for you guys, but I'm telling you, this fence is about 20 foot from me right now. It's outside though, and it's freaking cold. But I would put walnut stain on that. If it were mine, uh, granted, I would be embarrassed because this fence is in very bad shape. Um but if this were my fence at home, I'd put walnut on it. It's clean enough to get walnut. But I think we, I, I thought we could get it cleaner uh, using some, using a power washer. So that's what we did. So anyway, stick around to the end or leave and come back. That's perfectly fine too. I probably won't even know the difference. All right. Got some more comments in here. Home guard goes hard. I'll, I like that. And it's a YouTube channel. I'm going to check that one out. Uh, you have it going on, brother. I don't know that I do. I, I mean, to some extent, sure. But we all have stuff we're working on, right? So I have some stuff going on, sure. But it's always there's always room for improvement. But thank you. My wife tells me I need to do better at accepting compliments. Because usually my knee-jerk reaction is to send them away, not accept them. But anyway, thank you. Appreciate that. Sea Wolf says, I'll send you some health and tuna for the holidays. Brent, I don't know what I've done to deserve such a friend as yourself. But if that happens, I will thank you. If it doesn't happen, that's okay, too. We're still buddies. Don't feel like you have to send me stuff. But I will enjoy it, too. You know what? Oh, so we have team cooks uh, where we have, uh, not team cooks, but where we bring the whole team in final Friday where I cook lunch for them. That's probably actually what I'll do. I'll probably cook some of that up. Actually, we've got, so Tucker, uh, who, if you guys have been through here, Tucker, you know Tucker, but for those of you that haven't, he's our, uh, we call it, technically he's our project coordinator, I think is the term for it. Actually, I'm almost certain that is. But he's our communication conduit. So all communication goes through Tucker, and then he disseminates it where it needs to go. So that anyone has a question at any given time, Tucker likely knows the answer, or he can get it very quickly. Um, he's also an incredible cook. He is very good. So I'll probably get with Tucker and say, Hey, get some yellowfin tuna recipes going. Cook some of this up for the team. Let's feed them well. Nathan says, thinking about doing doing job nimbus. You guys use that program in what capacity? If so, yeah, we do. We use it for uh proposals for it basically anything for moving forward from proposal. So uh, all the communication is through job Nimbus. I'll give you our process. So we use the online quote tool, uh, my salesman, 
once it once we get a submission from my salesman, we create a. Uh, man, this drives me nuts when the hat's not right. I need just all right. So uh, my salesman submission comes in, goes to Tucker. So Tucker creates a uh, customer in Job Nimbus and a job, and then copies or not copies as uploads the submission into that. So we have the customer, all of their information or potential customer, all their information and the quote tool day one. You know, that is the first step. Uh, then he reaches out through email, says, thank you for submitting the quote tool. We'd love to have a conversation. You know, this, you know, depending on the project, this project is right up our alley. We love doing six foot tall privacy fences, cedar materials on steel posts. That's what we, that's what we love the most. Um, or something else about the project. Anyway, we like the project. We'd love to talk to you more about it as well as get you a firm price. So for those out there that aren't familiar with my salesman, it gives a price range, a range that we define. So we say, uh, here's our retail price. Now, I know, here's the thing. Sean King, if you're watching, Sean loves pricing by the panel. And when we price projects, we price by the panel. That's important because I don't want to steal Sean's thunder. You should watch Sean King, Mr. Fence's YouTube channel. I'm sure he talks about it there, but there is a very specific reason why you price per panel, not by foot. That being said, you enter in a retail price per foot on what it takes. Sean's like Beetlejuice. All you got to do is say his name and he pops up. I understand. And that's how we, that's how we bid it. And that's how we sell fence is by the section. But in, my salesman, you do it by the foot. You tell them how much, what is your retail price per foot for this given fence? For example, fake numbers, don't use these numbers. Also, this is not like violating any actual. Six foot privacy fence, say it costs $200 a foot. It doesn't, that's not what it costs, but this is a theoretical comparison. So you would tell my salesman, six foot privacy fence, Da, 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 you know, this style, this material, $200 a foot. And then you tell it the range you want it to provide to clients. So, you know, 5% below, 10% and above this number, give them that range. So as they draw it out and measures the footage, it is crazy accurate. And then it gives them a price range. Now, price range is nice because, as you guys know, not every yard's the same. I don't know that I've been in two yards that are wherever the same. Like they're always a little bit different. So the range helps with that, right? It also prepares the client for what the number is that's coming. It allows the client to say no ahead of time before you even interact with them. It allows them to look at that price and go, oof, that was more than I thought it was going to be. Good to know. Avoid the conversation altogether. Um, it also prepares them for the high number. So there's psychology involved here, which is, you know, setting a high price anchor and then coming down to your real number. So fake numbers, Mr. Miss Client, this project is going to be anywhere from $10,000 to $8,200. Well, Joe, you said that backwards. Usually it's $8,200 to $10,000, right? Well, we're setting a price anchor and the price anchor is $10,000, anywhere from $10,000 to $8,200. Now. So the client's getting ready and the client is going to sit there and justify if they can make $10,000 work Can they swing it Can they justify it. Does that meet their budget? So then you come in at random numbers, $8,453. Wait a minute. I was ready for 10. He said anywhere from 10,000 to 82. Okay. I was ready for 10,000. I was getting ready for that high number. That's actually 8,450 or whatever I said in my made up example. $8,400. That's, I was good with 10 grand. I'm also good with $8,400. Now we're talking about fence, right? We got past. So the first number is your anchor, right? So if you said $8,200 to $10,000, $8,200 to 10000 however you want to phrase it, the first number is the anchor. So they say $8,200. I can do that. 10000 but the first number I heard is $8,200. I can do $8,200. And then you say it's $8,450. Like, oh, Wait a minute, that's more than what we had talked about. Now, you told them 82 to 10. It's still under 10, but the first number is your anchor. So I say all that to say, 
my salesman gives in this range. Tucker reaches out. So in Job Nimbus, the the customer is created, the job is created. So we use customers and jobs because the idea is we want repeat customers with multiple jobs. So having a bunch of different customers doesn't make sense. One customer, multiple jobs. Customer and the job is created. Tucker reaches out says, we would love to talk to you about your project to get you a more specific price. I see that the price range was X to Y. We'd love to give you a more specific price after having a quick phone call and chatting with you about your project. Also talking about any concerns you might have moving forward. Here is the scheduling link. So then it allows them, we use a time tap for scheduling. I mean, guys use Calendly. There's a lot out there. I like time tap because when we're doing on site, so when we schedule on site, which is further down this process, but it calculates drive time. So you tell it, hey, I'm starting my day at 8 a.m., which is a the we're actually here like 7, 7 30, but we don't want any appointments before 8. So at 8 a.m., I will be leaving from this address, which is our office. It will calculate drive time to that next project, and then it'll also calculate drive time from every project after that one. So if you've got projects on different side of town it's going to accommodate for that drive time between the two makes it a little bit nicer. So we're not killing time in parking lots. That's what we used to do when we were doing in person. And before we found time tap to do to factor travel time, we'd always try to figure it out and then add five minutes for traffic, but we'd always end up sitting in a parking lot for five minutes somewhere close by waiting so we could show up just a couple minutes before the appointment, not 20 minutes before the appointment. I digress rabbit hole. So uh, scheduling link through time tap. You can also say this is a phone consultation or a virtual consultation. So this is done at my office. So it'll schedule them closer together. Uh, the client has a conversation or the potential client has a conversation with typically Sarah to talk about their project. She takes notes and asks, you know, in-depth questions, learning questions about the project, but not only the project, why we're doing this thing, right? So a couple, a couple questions are why the project? Why do you want to build a fence? Let's talk about it. Also, a good question is, why now? Why wasn't a month ago? Why isn't it a month from now? What makes right now the time to build this fence? Uh, we ask questions, learning questions, to try to learn more about the project, right? So we know, is there, you know, why are we doing the fence? Usually safety and security, right? Or neighbors. Neighbors are a valid answer. Uh, but let's just know what the motivation is, right? So that we can accurately give them our best advice so maybe they chose one type of fence and having this conversation we say we'd love to give you a price on that type of fence however can i give you an alternate for something that i think would might achieve this thing better sure yeah you bet uh or the win the win question is important why now why not a month ago why not a month from now why right now you get to learn if there's something that has to have that means this project has to happen now. Like, you know, it is November the 13th right now. Thanksgiving is around the corner. So someone says, well, I've got a bunch of family coming in for Thanksgiving and my cousins always bring their dog or whoever, like my sister always brings her dogs. Uh, so I got to have a fence up for my, for my sister's dogs when they come in for Thanksgiving. Well, bad news. I'd love to build this fence for you. And I'd love to keep in your sister's dogs. I think we could do a really good job at that that you will absolutely love. However, we can't have it done before Thanksgiving. It's only a couple of weeks away. Right now, we're really talking about keeping those dogs in before Christmas. Now, if your sister's also coming in for Christmas, we can have that done. But if it has to be done before Thanksgiving, we're probably not going to be a great fit for the project. Where should we go from here? My favorite question ever. What should we do? Where should we go from here? So uh, I'll come back. I'll circle back around to that question. Where should we go from here? What should we do? So we had that phone conversation. So then Sarah will enter their project details in Job Nemesis um, estimate builder. So we create a template. Now in this template is every single item that we're going to need to build this fence. How many pickets? How many rails? How many posts? How many nails? How many screws? Uh, how much concrete? All the things. If we're talking about chain link, how many nuts and bolts and tension bars and tension bands and brace bands and railings, how many things exactly are we going to need? Now, pro tip on the pickets, we add a percentage to whatever, you know, if it takes 
18, 17 pickets to this to this panel. 18 if you're using Postmasters to cover up that post. 19 if it's an in panel. 17 to 19 pickets. Whatever that, however many pickets is going to be. So this is the Sean King thing, right? And, and I'm sure this is the thing Sean King preaches is price per, per panel. So we know if there's 99, 99.3 panels, just because that's how the footage rolled out, we're going to bid 100 panels, right? Because the labor is probably going to be roughly the same to install that 0.3 panels rather than that full panel. Also, the materials are going to be roughly the same. We're still going to need the same amount of two by fours, even though we're cutting them. We're going to need all the extra stuff. So if we were pricing that by the foot, then that 0.3 would not accurately be depicted. Anyway, so in Job Nimbus, we have, you know, you know, so many sections of six-foot privacy fence, cedar materials on cedar structure on steel posts. That's what the customer sees, and then the customer sees a number. What we see on the back end is a tire list below that of you know, this many pickets, this many rails, this many posts, this many nails, this many screws, this much concrete, this much labor. We also have a line item for using our equipment. If I were going to go rent equipment for this project, what would I pay for that equipment? That number goes in. Now, we own the equipment. We don't go rent it. However, I now have money built into this project for if – that equipment goes down and we need to go rent it. That's okay. I already got it in the number. Go get it. Get that equipment fixed because it's a better deal if we use our equipment, right? But we aren't upside down automatically if we have to go rent equipment. Also, we're going to have to replace this equipment further on down the road. Now, equipment also includes our truck and our trailer. The truck has a maximum service life, right? The trailer has a maximum service life. The truck and trailer also have service items. If we weren't building this project, we, won't, we wouldn't be putting this many miles on the truck. We wouldn't be running this much fuel through the truck. We wouldn't be putting this much wear and tear on the truck. So this project is allocated a percentage of the maintenance and replacement costs of that truck. It's a piece of equipment. It gets added in. Um, I don't even know. Oh, so then that's the proposal. We send the proposal off. The customer looks at it and says, you know what? Looks great. I'm ready to do the project. Come right out and see me. Fantastic. I'd love to. A couple things. Tucker is going to email you a digital contract that is created within Job Nimbus that you can digitally sign, just like the real deal, only it's easier and it's faster. Also, we're going to email you an invoice for this project. So the, in, the invoice can actually be paid online too through Job Nimbus. Well, their partner, we pay. The great thing about that, it passes the finance charge or the convenience fee, whatever you want to call it, onto the client. So if it's $1,000, it tells the client $1,000 due plus fee, transaction, they call it a transaction fee, equals X. This is what you will be paying today. Now, if a client calls in and says, I don't want to pay that fee. Perfect. Absolutely understand. I wouldn't want to either. So if you would, you could bring us by a check. You could put it in the mail whatever is most convenient for you. As soon as we get back the signed contract and the deposit, we'll go ahead and get your project scheduled. We'll also schedule time for me to come on site, shake your hand, meet your dog, learn everything about your project. We also say verify the measurements. However, we know measurements are good. It's going to be within a margin of error. So we're really there just to meet and greet, say hello. Anything weird about the project? Let's see if anything wasn't in the picture that was submitted on my salesman. Now, is there risk to this? Of course. What happens, Joe, when you get out there and it's completely different? Well, you call for a timeout. You say, you know what? We missed it. Whatever, whatever it is. Now, also part of the conversation initially that Sarah's having on the phone is what am I not seeing? Now, you're looking at the same satellite, you know, she's talking to the client. She said, no, you're looking at the same satellite image I am, right? I see the house. I see the pool. I see this. I see that. We're looking at the same picture, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, when picturing your backyard, what isn't on this picture? Is there a new shed? Is there a new neighbor? Does a neighbor have a new shed? What isn't on this picture that's actually in your yard when you go look at it right now? What isn't there? So we give them the opportunity to tell us what the differences are, right? But what if you get out there and it's wildly different? Then you have that conversation. 
say, you know, Mr. Customer, Miss Customer, I got to call a timeout. We, you know, we really missed this one or whatever it is. Let's call a timeout. Let's regroup. Now, if this is a deal breaker, I completely understand. I get it. I can get you your deposit back immediately. I'll also hand you your contract, let you shred that thing. We have a shutter. We can do it for two, but I'll hand it to you. I'll let you do with what you want with it. No harm, no foul. We can both walk away. Or here's also a solution where we can handle that. That conversation happens maybe once a year. I don't know that we've given back a deposit this year. I don't know that we have. We gave one back last year, and that's because scheduling changed. So he had given us a, a time frame that he needed done in. We agreed. We scheduled it. All of a sudden, timeline just had to get pushed up. We said no. He said, I want my money back. Send him his money back. Easy peasy. So uh, I don't think that's happened this year where we get out there and something's just so wildly different that we can't produce the project at the price we gave them. Um, anyway, so in job Nimbus, we now uh, transfer that in or that estimate. We copy it into a work order. So now our guys have a work order list, a materials list of every single everything we have priced into that project. How many pickets, posts, rails, nails, screws, everything. How many feet, bags of concrete, how many hours we expect, main hours we expect this job to be completed in so that at the end of the project, we can look back on this list also and say we needed more pickets or we needed more hours or we needed less hours. We actually got this done ahead of time and, and with less material, whatever it is. We now have this work order, this materials list that we can operate from. They know what to load. Well, we're, one process we're working on now is preloading, right? So what can we do to pre-pull all the materials needed for these projects to reduce the amount of time the crew spends on the yard? Because when the truck and the crew are on the yard, they're not out in the field. They're not generating revenue. They're not at home. They're not with their buddies, not with their friends. Let's get you home as quickly as possible. So start pre-pulling orders. We have a work order that has a complete material list. Let's just pull it ahead of time. Get a couple guys in the yard doing nothing but pulling orders. That's what we're working on. We're actually hiring that position right now we made the calls friday to guys to come in so we'll see um yep so then we complete the project so all the communication is still going on within job nimbus job nimbus does a great job at tracking emails and, and making sure they stay in the customer file um we go through project so uh we have different um, what do you call them folders i guess different verticals within job nimbus so they are they go from project uh, project walkthrough to project scheduled. So then it generates a task for either Tucker or Sarah to send them an email that says, great news, your project is scheduled. We're planning on being there the week of X. It's important to give them a week range, not a day we're going to be on site because it rains, guys call in. It's going to be the week of X. Uh, after the project is scheduled, the next uh, vertical, well, if, if materials are in stock, the next vertical is uh, locate scheduled. Now, there is one in between there for if we have to order materials, which is pretty uh, pretty few and far between. Typically, everything we build is from stock. Uh, but if we were to order materials, there would be another email that says, great news, your materials on order. The manufacturer has given us an expected day of X, which is typically the day they give us plus a cushion because we all know the suppliers we work with. Uh, I'll let you know as soon as the materials are in stock. Once materials come in, there's another email. Great news. Materials are in stock. We got them in. They look great. We're still on schedule to be to your project the week of X. Uh, next email, standard email that goes out is your utility locates are scheduled. Hey, by the way, we notified Missouri One Call. Uh, we let them know that we'd be out there the week of X. So you should expect them the week prior. Uh, we actually schedule them for the Friday before your project starts because on Fridays, Sarah and our project foreman, our crew chief, whatever you like to call him, uh, they go around to the projects. That way they can walk through the projects, make sure they're located, see if the the utility locates are going to mean that that project gets moved a little bit, whatever. Um, so the, that email goes out. And then it is, you know, so then the Friday before the project, they get another email. Hey, just a reminder, great news. Still on schedule to be to you next week. 
Uh, now, which day we were on site depends on weather and timing, what projects get done before you know your project. But we will, we are still on schedule to be your project next week. Uh, then the project starts and is completed typically within a week. We typically start projects on Mondays and Tuesdays, finish them on Thursdays and Fridays. So what sets Monday finishes Thursday, what sets Tuesday finishes Friday because we set in concrete. I wish we could drive. I wish that was reality because then we could really tighten up those timelines. Um, yep. Then the project is done. They get an email. Uh, this email comes from me and I say, you know, I really appreciate you putting your trust in our family's company. It means a lot to me and it would mean a lot to my granddad. Should he still be, you know, if he was still here, uh, we really do appreciate it. Uh, you'll find attached your final invoice. Um, you'll find your final invoice attached. This invoice can be paid online. However, please note there is a fee associated if you do uh, pay this online. If you choose not to, we also accept uh, checks and we accept cash in person. Note, there is not a discount for cash. We still, what I say, I, there's something quirky in there. Like, no, there is no discount in cash. We report it just as we're saying we report everything else. Anyway, um, also, if you'd like to schedule a final walkthrough with Sarah, she would love to come out and see the project. She can also pick up your payment at the same time. You can schedule that on site by clicking here time tap link um yep that get then once the project gets paid it generates another task for me to create a lien waiver again just another document in in uh, job nimbus pulls all the relevant information out of the contact uh, the name the address da, 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 and saying so well so we invoice it then once they once they pay the invoice it generates a task for me to create a lien waiver as well as a paid invoice i email that that out to them uh, from there, they go into our follow-up campaigns, which is typically a six-month and one-year follow-up. Hey, it's been six months since we were out there. I'd like to make sure that everything still looks incredible. If you'd like to schedule a time for me to come out here and take a look at it, I'd love to. Here's the link. One year. Looks like it's been about 12 months since we were out there. I'd still love to come out and take a look at it. Now, we have a lifetime workmanship warranty, but I'd really like to catch any sort of issues before they become big issue. So you can schedule that by clicking the link below. Um, and then it just goes on and on and on. We use job Nimbus extensively. That being said, we're probably using it at half of its power. Eh, maybe not half, maybe 75% of its power. Uh, this it's an incredibly powerful tool. It's not inexpensive. It is expensive. Nah, it's not expensive, but it does cost money, right? It's not cheap, but I think it's worthwhile. We enjoy it. We use it extensively. So yeah. So Nathan, I hope that answers this question. Thinking about job Nimbus, I love using a lot. If you like more detailed information, uh, shoot me a message. I'd be glad to talk to you about it. Actually, probably what I'd be more glad to do is connect you with Sarah. If she uses it day in and day out, she would probably have more specific knowledge. I've got the general idea of what we do, but her and Tucker are in this thing every day and they like to customize it too. So they could probably give you more detailed feedback, but I'd also be happy to help. You got it. I will, I will shoot you a message. You better believe it. Concerned distributors. Welcome. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Coming to you from Philly. I still need to get out there and see, I need to, uh, I need to get out to Philly in general. Actually, I think Caleb was talking about maybe us going out to Philly uh, to do a training out there, probably with you guys, if I were guessing. Um, let's put that together. I'd like to go see Philly. I'd like to see the history you guys have out there. Um, yeah. Also, there's another YouTube channel I watch called uh, Luxury Bazaar. Uh, they're out of Philly. I'd like to see those guys, Roman and his guys. Um, yeah. Bo Butler, welcome. Hey, Joe, could you do a share screen of your job Nimbus? Hide your pricing, but it would be really helpful to see how you set up your material items to build your quotes. Um, Yeah, so let's think about that. Could I do that now? I don't know. Mm, let's set that up. Uh, so, yeah, I, I I would be more than happy to. So the hesitation is if I pulled it up right now, it's going to have all of our prices in it, right? So not that I'm – I don't mind sharing anything like that, what we pay for materials, what we charge for materials – However, <laughs> there are uh, rules about price comparison. Um, there's antitrust laws out there, and I don't want to run afoul of those because those are the big ones. Those are the uh, federal charges. So, but Bo, I tell you what, 
Jeremy watches these because as you guys probably know, we do hot takes every Wednesday, which is basically a snippet, two or three snippets of this conversation that then we put out on Wednesday mornings or yeah, Wednesday mornings, I think is when they go out. Um, so Jeremy will be watching this. Jeremy, please remind me to do a segment on Job Nimbus uh, to create a couple sample uh, accounts, a sample customer, sample financials, sample everything. We'll just set everything to a dollar and we'll go from there. I think it would be helpful to see uh, what materials we include and what labor and equipment we include, everything like that, to show what the process is from proposal to work order to invoice to the whole thing. So as you're watching this, please remind me that we need to set up that video. The sin bin. All right. What's the optimum def depth to dig for a fence post? For a fence with a height of three meters, about 10 foot. So, <clears throat> depends on the area, right? So, it depends on what your soil is and all that. 10 foot tall, you're likely getting into probably wanting to have an engineer design that just because at 10 foot, you're going to get a lot of load on that fence. Um, typically, a number that some people will throw around is half the distance of the fence. So, for, for three meters, you'd be a meter and a half deep. Uh, but you'd want to, you'd want to consult a professional about that because like I said, as, as you're getting that tall, it's going to have a lot of load, uh, at the, at minimum, it's going to have a lot of wind load. Even if it's a pass through chain link fence, it's still going to get load on it. Especially if you're in an area that freezes as ice accumulates on that fence, it's going to make it significantly heavier. Uh, rough rule of thumb, half the distance of the fence, half, half in the ground for what's above ground, right? So. In the case of three meters, it'd be about a meter and a half deep. But please consult a local professional on that. Caleb, Caleb John, good day, sir. I don't, Caleb, I don't know that I ever knew your middle name. I mean, I assume this is Caleb Roth because it's got stainless steel experts guy there in the logo. Welcome, Caleb. I now know what your middle name is. Thank you for joining us. Hey, Caleb, also, we had a, let me show you a question real quick and get your thoughts on it. Here it is. Uh, is there ever an appropriate time to mix mineral spirits and stainless steel expert stain more specifically for new fence or wood? Uh, if you want to answer that question in the chat, by all means, or we can address that in our next video, which might be more appropriate because I have a feeling this is a conversation on when, when is and is not uh, appropriate for that. But just so you know, the question's out there. Kasurik says, yes, we're putting on a training in the spring. Beautiful. I'd love, if, if you'll have me, I'd love to come be a part of it. Absolutely. I'd love to see Philly. Jim Babbitt says, been thinking about doing, about going to fence tech. What all goes on there? I'm new to fencing. I couldn't, I couldn't uh, recommend it anymore. Uh, it is a great time. So what, what happens at fence tech? We should probably have, we should probably chat about this when we've got a couple more fence guys on. But um, training happens at Fence Tech. So typically, uh, AFA University goes on. So they'll, they'll have some trainings, uh, whether it's their certification programs uh, or just trainings in general. They'll also have uh, workshops and seminars being put on by, typically, it's by the sponsors. So uh, trainings, seminars, typically a really nice keynote speaker giving a talk on some, you know, a relevant subject to the industry at that point in time, which is something I like. It's typically pretty timely to something going on in the current market or just the, the environment in general. Um, something that, that has to do with this industry at that point in time uh, also has a great trade show. So a really nice selection of all the vendors, both established and new uh, in the industry. So that's something I enjoy i uh, seeing is kind of what's out there uh, in terms of materials, in terms of equipment, software, everything. They're all there. This is people that have a product or a service that they like to or they want to promote to fence people. So it's a good time to be there. More than anything, it is other like-minded individuals getting together for a common cause, and that is to better the industry. <coughs> Excuse me. It's kind of dry out here, I Probably because of the weather, right? So uh, it's it's fence guys and gals. People who are passionate, or Sean says nerdy about uh, fence. 
who really just want to talk about fence. That is my most enjoyable part of this is getting to meet new fence guys or just fence guys I haven't met before and gals and just talking fence, right? Is, you know, what's going on in the industry, what's coming up in the industry, uh, what trouble, not trouble, but what, you know, what frustrations do you have? Do I have a solution for the frustrations? What frustrations I'm having? Have you seen that before? And if so, how do you accomplish that? You know, because here's the thing is no matter where you're from and literally no matter where in the world you're from, fence is pretty similar, right? So we all have different, maybe different versions of similar methods or different versions of similar styles, that sort of thing. You know, you might, uh, again, you might have a conversation, he did or otherwise, on which side of the fence you should put the smooth side of a, of a wooden fence. Um, you could certainly talk about <laughs> wet set versus dry set concrete. You could even talk about the foam. We got a video on that. Uh, maybe it works for you and your part of the world. I don't know. Um, different techniques, different methods, that sort of thing. It's, it's getting around like-minded individuals, you know, for four or five days, depends on how long you're in town. Um, typically dinners with sponsor or di dinners with manufacturers are always a good time. They usually, uh, the big manufacturers and, and wholesalers typically have one night during fence tech where they invite all their clients and potential clients to dinner or to just basically networking events. Uh, again, getting around like-minded individuals around some good music, maybe some drinks, possibly some food. So it is a really good time. So Jim, that's a great question. I would like to, I would like to, so that's my answer. But I'd also like to see what you guys think about Finstech. I want you guys to drop comments in. Let's do this. Drop a comment below if you're planning on going to Finstech this year. Um, I know, I know there is talk going on right now about whether or not someone should attend Finstech because of <clears throat> current regulations, right? Like pandemic, pandemic prevention stuff. I do not want that conversation in the chat. Pretty please. Let me know if you're going, you know, and, and if you're not going and it's not one of the, I just don't want to start a fight in the chat guys, right? Like if you're not going, let us know why let's have a constructive conversation, please. Uh, and go from there. But if you're going to fence tech, let me know. If you're not going, let me know. I mean, I'm planning on going actually, I think, uh, me and Jeremy, the, my behind the scenes guy, uh, and uh, Sarah, I believe the three of us are going to go to Fence Tech this year. Uh, I'm going to go do some content and to meet suppliers, wholesalers, that sort of thing. Um, for those of you not going, I want to uh, I want to show you kind of what goes on, right? Introduce you to maybe some new new suppliers or new manufacturers or new tools. You know, I want we'll plan on doing content from Fence Tech on stuff I find interesting at Fence Tech. Let me know in the chat below if you're going to Finstech. What do you love? What do you love about Finstech? What do you enjoy? Or if you've never been, what what would you like to see at Finstech? Bo Butler says we'd that would be great. So talking about Job Nimbus doing a uh, doing a video on how we use Job Nimbus. Uh, we use Job Nimbus and love it, but I feel like we are overcomplicating the process. Easy to do. So Job Nemesis is incredibly powerful. It really is. Um, now, it wasn't built for the fencing industry. Uh, it was actually built for the roofing industry, but there's a lot of correlation there, right? Uh, and it works really well for the fencing industry. Now, there are some features that are included in other softwares that aren't included in this software. I get it. That's okay. Uh, it's a software that we found works best for us. We've used others, and we've come back to Job Nemesis. And I can't tell you how much of a pain it is to move from one system to another. But we wanted to try what else was out there. So we moved about three times. We, oh, we started, uh, we started with CFS, uh, computer fencing software or systems or whatever. Uh, for one reason or another, we decided to leave and we tried, where do we go from there? I think we went from there to Job Nimbus. Uh, Job Nimbus is incredible incredibly powerful but there's a there's a lot there so i decided maybe we try something simpler something easier for the guys to understand and interact with uh so we've also tried uh, service monster 
We tried what else we tried? Well, in the sales office, we tried pipeline, which pipeline works, but it doesn't do everything we want. That's kind of the story here, right? Is it works, but not exactly the way I want it to work. It doesn't do everything. So we started Frankensteining things together, you know, pipe drive with uh service monster. Uh, we also used the customer factor. Um they worked, but just not. They didn't do everything we wanted it. We wanted a CRM or CRM is kind of a vague term for, for what this software is, I suppose. Um, but that's what we'll call it a CRM. When we came back to job Nimbus, it costs more expensive. It's a little bit more complicated to get going in the beginning. Like there's a steeper learning curve to it, but it does 90% of what we want it to do. You know, can, can you draw out a fence on the software and have it, come up with your material list. No, you still need to come up with your material list. Even when we were drawing it, so with, with you know, the fencing software, the computer for CFS, we were drawing it out and it has a great tool to where when you draw out the fence, it will uh, scale it proportionally and it'll do your material takeoffs. Very nice. Um, I was I still found myself double checking it. Right, because I want to make sure there's not a weird bug somewhere. So I'd still draw it out in graph. My process is to draw it off on graph paper. One square equals one section of fence. Does it work all the time? No. No, not every, not most yards aren't square, right? But it gets pretty close. So when you pair that with an actual satellite image from my salesman, uh, it gets the job done, right? So does it have the draw tool? No, it doesn't. But I don't know that that's a that's a you know a, a significant enough um, issue to make us go elsewhere. So there's just more things that Job Nimbus does that others don't do uh, that I really enjoyed that keep us there. Like I said, it's more expensive than the others for sure. Now. <clears throat> The fin software, uh, computer fencing software, there is a significant upfront charge. What what rubbed me wrong was in order to keep that map draw function, you also have to upgrade it once or twice a year. I think it's twice a year. It might just be once a year. But so you have a significant upfront charge just to get the software, and then you pay once or twice a year indefinitely uh, to keep this thing working. Now it's an up. They're updates. You're paying for the update. The thing is, it was often thing is often updating things that we didn't even use, right? Like the we don't do a lot of vinyl, so vinyl shop drawings not super helpful for us, right? Or or it was updating some aluminum or steel provider that we didn't use anyway, so we didn't need that update. The problem is once you get past I think two updates and you haven't updated, the software automatically shuts out your your map draw right or quick draw whatever they call it anyway rub me the wrong way lots of people use it lots of people like it absolutely understood anyway so that got us to that it got to job nimbus job nimbus while expensive is still less expensive than paying once or twice a year these update fees so is what it is it also does it also does quite a bit more so you can keep all of your email conversations in one platform so rather than keeping your email window open and the proposal and this and that, it's all in one window. You have all of your email communication. It also it it also has a text integration, I believe. We don't use it, but I believe uh, Dan Blanc Fensking, I believe he's talked about before where he has it integrated in with his phone system and his text messaging system. So you can even integrate it even more. We use Company Cam to document pre- what do you say during like pre-construction, during construction, post-construction photos and videos of the project and what's going on. Uh, that integrates well with Job Nimbus. Um, it works. It just really works well. So anyway, you can easily overcomplicate the process though. You can absolutely do that. Ask me how I know. First time around, I overcomplicated it tremendously. Um, now, Job Nimbus also offers training. So that's an option. Uh, their, uh, their annual conference this year was in Cabo. 
So definitely considered that one. However, like getting in and out of the United States, well, no, getting out of the United States right now isn't tricky at all. Getting back in, you got to pass, you know, you got to have a clean test. And what if it's not a clean test or, you know, a, a negative COVID? What if it's not? Are you stuck there? I don't want to be stuck anywhere and not be able to come home to see my family and run this business. Cabo was not a great idea for me. For one guy. Maybe you feel like that's fine. That's fine. But anyway. Um, all right. That helps a lot. Thanks. Awesome. I, I always I always give the answers I think will help, and then I hope for the best. I'm, I'm glad that answer was helpful. Uh, talking about uh, three meter high fence. How deep should you set the post? Roughly, you know, if we're talking about straight rule of thumb without knowing about frost depth, without knowing about soil conditions or anything, half the distance above the ground in the ground. All right. You get it. Six foot fence, put three foot in the ground. Not on new fences. Uh, so Caleb is responding to the question about is there a time that's appropriate to thin down sand seal experts with mineral spirits on new fences? New fences need the oil. And that's that was kind of that was kind of my experience. So Caleb, I had shared that uh when using a uh fence pre-staining machine, we had tried thinning down the oil with mineral spirits with <clears throat> with some coverage issues. Um, just because you need all of it. You need especially on new wood that's that's wanting to soak up and absorb all the stain possible. You need to give it all the stain possible. See ya, or you have a blessed day. Brent, you as well. I appreciate it. I will shoot you a message about that yellow fin tuna. The guys are going to lose their minds about this, I think. So, all right. Let's do this. Let's all watch this week's video together. So, all right. I'm going to preface this by saying had some audio issues. I don't know what audio issues. I don't know why we're having the audio issues. So, what it sounds like. It sounds like the audio was peaking and we didn't catch it. So it was clipping. He's clipping the top. So the audio just sounds clipped. Uh, sorry. We didn't catch that until we did editing. And then it's like, it's what's done is done. You can't go back and reshoot this particular video. All right. Let's watch this week's video together. This one is titled how to power watch a fence. The ultimate fence cleaning video. Welcome back, everybody. Joe Everest, the fence expert. If you've great. been following along with this wood cleaning series, you know what we're getting ready to do. If not, a short recap. We've been cleaning this fence using Stainless Steel Experts line of wood cleaner, wood stripper, both followed up with a wood brightener to see how clean we can get this fence. Now, this is not a paid promotion. We're not getting paid to make this video. But to be clear, Stainless Steel Experts did send us the chemicals for free. So... Take that for what it's worth. I always want to. I always want to make it clear to you guys that are watching, like what the situation is, because I think we've all watched videos um, that make you wonder, like, is this a paid promotion or is this, like, what's the motivation behind making this video? This is actually a question I get quite a lot: is about you know proper process and procedure for cleaning a fence before you stain it. Does it need to be cleaned? Which that's actually a good video to do in the future. Uh, should you clean your fence before you sand it? Actually, before we take this, so we're taking this wood fence down. We're actually ripping all this out for a video that's coming up for a a, a manufacturer video. Um, but before we do that, we should probably stain this fence just to give an idea what this looks like uh, on a clean and not clean fence. Anyway, so yeah, that's I always want to be clear with everyone watching exactly what's going on as far as sponsorship paid promotion, that sort of thing. Like I said, we used a wood cleaner and wood brightener on these boards. We use a wood stripper and wood brightener on these boards. The wood stripper seemed to work a little bit better than the wood cleaner. I think just because there was such an intense amount of algae and just organic growth on the boards. When we rinse them, we rinse them with a garden hose because that's typically what you guys are going to have at home available readily to clean your fence. But if we were paid to clean this fence, we would bring out a power washer. Now, we're not looking for the pressure so much as we are the water volume. The water pressure or the water volume coming out of a residential faucet is typically three to four gallons a minute. 
it could be as low as one or two gallons a minute, depending on well water versus city water. Anyway, we're going to bring out a power washer. Wash this fence with eight and a half gallons a minute. We're going to put a lot of water on this fence to try to clean it just a little bit more. If you've been following along with the series, you know what step comes first. We're going to get this fence wet. All right, guys, let's talk about orifice for just a second because I think it's important to talk about here. This tip is what would typically come on a power washer. It's a green tip, 25 degree. Now, both of these tips are also 25 degree. That's simply talking about the fan size coming out of the nozzle. If you guys notice, the orifice size here is significantly smaller than either of these. So when the orifice size is smaller, you actually get incredibly more pressure. You get a lot of pressure coming out of this nozzle as compared with these two nozzles. So that's why I say when you're using a power washer, use the largest orifice size possible. So in a standard pressure washer kit, that would probably be the soap nozzle just the hole in the nozzle is going to be significantly larger. We're not looking for a lot of pressure. If we were to use this head as opposed to one of these heads. So as, a, <laughs> as I was watching this during the first edit, I realized I probably overemphasized this point quite a lot, the uh, pressure versus volume conversation. But you probably can't say it enough, right? I don't want someone going out there just, completely destroying not destroying but really uh defacing a fence but as you'll see <clears throat> i bring this up a, a few times this could possibly do more damage than one of these would one of these it's going to be a gentle wash but it's a significant amount of volume we're throwing as much water as at this fence as we can so like i said if you remember nothing else the larger the hole the softer the spray and the less damage you could possibly do to the fence so again, guys, we're not using a ton of pressure. It's basically a little bit more volume than what you would get out of your regular host at your house. We're not looking for pressure. We're looking for volume. So again, the reason we're pre-rinsing the boards is so it keeps all of our cleaner near the surface. As long as it's on the first few outer layers, that's really where all of the organic growth is going to reside. It needs sunlight to grow. So it's going to stay on the outer layer. It also makes sure the cleaner doesn't get trapped inside the board when we rinse it. When we neutralize it, then rinse it. So I think this fence is pretty well uh, wet. Now we're going to get to mixing the chemicals. All right. So once again, we're going to be using the Stain Steel Experts wood stripper because there's an incredible amount of organic growth here. And then followed up with the wood brightener. The wood brightener is going to neutralize the cleaner, but it's also going to bring out as much of the natural beauty as we can get out of that board. Now, this fence doesn't have rust streaks from the nails, but if it did, the oxalic acid would also go ahead and neutralize those. So, wood brightener is a uh, multi-purpose tool, if you will. Now, each one of these is pre-packaged, one package per gallon. We've got two pump-up stirrers here, each with two gallons. Of I do like that, that it comes pre-portioned. Um, in the past, the chemicals that we had used come just bulk. Right. So, well, and even maybe not bulk, but they come in just one package. So then you have to measure it out. Um, so for owner operators out there, that's probably, that's probably fine. I mean, you're the one doing the measuring and the mixing. Uh, but once you start scaling this process and, and you're trusting the process to your team members, you have to start considering, you know, maybe not what does someone do on an off day, right? On their best day, they probably measure it exactly right. They probably mix it exactly right. They, they have the correct proportions. What happens on an off day or what happens when something else is on their mind, et cetera. These are pre-portioned. I believe I get ready to talk about that. They're all also color coded to try to take as much of that error factor out. And I really, as, as a business owner, I appreciate that. The water in it. So we know we need two packs of cleaner and two packs of wood brightener per container. Now, after we get the chemicals in the pop up sprayers, we need to make sure they're mixed really well. And that way we're, sure that we're getting all the cleaning effectiveness out of each of the chemicals. So we've got just a standard battery power drill here and a paint mixer from, again, the local home improvement stores. Uh, this came from the paint sections. You typically used to mix up paint, but today we're going to use it to mix up chemicals. Now, as we've talked about in previous videos, I like that each of the different chemicals is color-coded. That way we know at a glance what chemical we're dealing with, whether it's the eco cleaner whether it's the wood cleaner or whether it's the wood stripper they're each different colors so that i know at a glance exactly what's in this sprayer 
Now, if you've not worked with chemicals before, you're just really not used to working with them, I would probably suggest some uh, protective equipment. You know, some gloves would be a good idea. Uh, maybe some maybe some eye covering, maybe some goggles. That way, uh, if it maybe splash up into your eyes, you wouldn't get a chemical burn. All right, so the rest of the process, or the next step in the process is we're going to apply the wood stripper, then we'll rinse it again. We'll apply the wood brightener, rinse it for a final time. Let's put the wood stripper on the fence and see how it does. Now, as we've talked about in other videos, I'm starting at the bottom and working my way to the top. That way, the chemical that reaches the board first is going to be new cleaner, so it's not cleaner that's been uh, diluted with whatever's coming off the board. If we were to start at the top and work our way down, likely you'd be getting some diluted cleaner at the bottom. So for, for washing, we start at the bottom and work our way up. For rinsing, we start at the top and work our way down because we're trying to get all of that contaminant off the board for cleaning, or for rinsing rather. All right, so we've got one good application of the cleaner up on the boards. It's already looks like it's doing some work. We'll kind of give it a little bit of scrape test here. We see that it's already coming off pretty easily. We're gonna go ahead and apply this again. The algae growth is pretty thick, so we wanna get as much cleaning chemical on the board as possible. We'll give it two, maybe three applications, depending on uh, how easily this uh, algae growth starts coming off the board. All right, so now we've got the cleaner applied to the wood. Now all we do is wait. So we're gonna let this dwell for about 10 minutes, come back and give it a rinse. All right, guys, we're gonna give this a rinse. Before we put the uh, cleaner on it, we're gonna try to get as much of this organic growth off as possible before putting the brightener on it. Now again, we're using the power washer for volume, not pressure. Not a lot of pressure here, guys. So one thing to note here too, since we're using more pressure than your standard faucet, we need to talk about how we're washing this and what direction are we washing it. We're gonna be washing this top to bottom, then bottom to top, always following the wood grain. So that if there is a little bit of streaking because you're using a little bit more pressure, you know, if these boards are really soft, it would follow the wood grain to be a little bit less noticeable. If you're going against the wood grain, that would start to become very noticeable. So when you're using pressure, anything above a standard water faucet at your house, you want to follow the wood grain. Now that's applicable whether we're talking about fences, decks, really any wood in general that we're washing. Now while the camera is off, I was demonstrating to Jeremy what would happen when a green tip was on the power washer and used on a board. I guess forgetting that this is for a YouTube channel and we should have been recording that. So take two, we're going to clean this board with just a standard 25 degree green tip that you would see on a pressure washer. Now, at first glance, it seems like this nozzle is doing a great job. And this is why this is why some people will start using this because, like I said, at first glance, from this far away, it looks pretty good, right? And give you, I think you'll see for yourself why this is a bad idea. It got the board quite a bit cleaner, but as you can see, and Jeremy will show you close ups here in a minute. You can see everywhere that it started and stopped, even using vertical motions following the grain, you're still going to have, even using sweeping motions, you're going to have these start and stop lines. It's just not a great look. So, granted, it could come a little bit cleaner using the power washer tips, but you're gonna, it's, overall it's going to be a worse experience. I think when we brighten this and rinse it again, I think that's going to become even more evident. And now we apply the wood brightener, the oxalic acid. All right, so we've got our wood brightener applied. Like every other application, we're going to give it 10 minutes to really dwell, and then we'll rinse it back off again. All right, now for the final rinse. All right, guys, so we've got the fence clean. Now we need to give it a few days, let it dry out to really get a good look at it and determine what we think about it. So we'll be right back. All right, guys. Well, through the magic of YouTube editing, once again, here we are several days later. I say several days because we went through a tremendous amount of rainstorms here in southwest Missouri. We gave it a little bit extra time to dry out, but I think the results speak for themselves. So just to recap, on my left, your right, we had the wood stripper, but with... So, and also you guys notice the boards, the boards on my left here aren't nearly as green as they were. I th What I think happened was we got overspray from the stripper on those boards. 
and just the mist that might have oversprayed onto those boards really killed the organic growth. Now, we didn't rinse it really well, so it didn't rinse all that off of there. But, like I said, if you'll notice, all right, where are we? We're at 908. If you compare that to these, these were it was really green to start with. So I think that's I think that's probably what happened was we got some overspray on it. Did kill the organics, but we didn't rinse the organics off. But with just a uh, a hose fitting, right? The hose handle, very light pressure, lower volume here. It did okay. If we're using a really dark stain, I think that covers a lot of this up. I think that would be acceptable, but one thing to mention too. So obviously to my right, your guys is left. Um, well, my right on the video. Anyway, um, the bottom half does look cleaner than the top half. That's because that bottom half has been cleaned at least twice, maybe three times. Do we clean it? I think it's been cleaned three times. So in, in different demonstration videos, which probably illustrates the fact that if you were to clean it let it dry clean it again let it dry clean it a third time let it dry you can get it a little bit more clean uh, but if this were my house i would have cleaned it once that top half of that fence is acceptable to put stain on it's a clean fence it will take stain excep exceptionally well uh, but just interesting to note that that bottom half, like I said, it's been cleaned two or three times by the time this video was taken. I uh, got a little bit cleaner than the top half. If we're looking for using a lighter stain or we're really concerned about getting everything off this board, I think the power washer is probably the way to go. Let me remind you, on the pressure washer, use a really low pressure, high volume tip. Typically, the orifice size is larger. The spray pattern is wider. If you're just using the default tips that come with the power washer, use the soap nozzle. It's wide. It's really open. Not a lot of pressure, but a ton of volume. Obviously, these boards are looking really nice, except for the vines and associated other nonsense growing through them. This fence will eventually get torn down and replaced. But if we're purely looking at the boards, I think these turned out super nice so again i think the best process if you've got wood that has a ton of organic growth that's really stubborn would be the stain seal experts stripper the wood stripper combined with the oxalic acid the wood brightener and followed up with a power washer with a very low pressure very high volume tip which is exactly the boards we see here all in all i think it's a great result let me know what you think in the comments below but until next time, I'm Joe Evers, the fence expert, reminding you that good fences make good neighbors. All right. Well, there we go. Let me know what you guys think, how that fence turned out. Um, yeah, so like I said, if we were cleaning that fence professionally, we would have probably started with the uh, wood stripper with the power washer. Actually, yeah, I probably would have. So it was right there. I, I really thought that the wood cleaner – would have had more of an impact. I really underestimated how much organic growth was on uh, those boards. So we typically go with the the uh, guaranteed solution, right? So if it was close, if it was somewhere between a wood cleaner and wood stripper, we'd probably just use the stripper on it, wet everything down tremendously well, apply it, rinse everything off tremendously well, all the grass and shrimp. I mean, this is, it's heavy duty stuff, right? So we're going to want to protect the, the siding, the gutter, the gutters, especially because typically it's going to be pretty easy to strip the coating off a gutter or a downspout. So we're going to want to protect those likely cover them, the downspouts, um, and, and be very, um, intentional with where we're spraying those chemicals. But, the wood stripper would be the 100% solution on something like that. Now, uh, there's also other solutions. You know, you could add some uh, butyl booster to it if you had an existing stain that you were really wanting to bring off those boards before you put a new coat on. There's other options available. Uh, but if we're just talking about organic growth, what I'm interested in, and we'll probably do this at my dad's house. So he has a fence that we installed. Oh, probably. And it was probably 14, 15 years ago, maybe. 
with cedar materials. I believe that one was on wood. No, it was. Mm, I think it's steel post. I, the gate post, I think. So it had a fence that was even older that we replaced. We left the six by six gate posts um, for his request. Um, so it's got wood gate posts. I want to say we replaced it with steel uh, with Postmaster fence posts, but cedar material, right? Not a lot of organic growth, more gray than anything. I'd like to try the percarbonate cleaner on that, the eco cleaner. Um, I'm I'm a pretty big fan also of if it doesn't need so if there's not organic growth or a previous stain going with the most gentle solution possible, the eco cleaner. Um, so the eco cleaners, you're not going to have to take as much precaution with siding downspouts with grass and bushes. You still want to take precaution. You never want to not be careful, right? But eco cleaner is just a lot easier to use. So the, which is a, the sodium percarbonate. So I think we'll probably end up doing a video at his place, which we've already lost the weather. So I have a feeling it's going to be the spring, uh, which would probably be a good, uh, good amount of time to let this video run for a little bit. And then, uh, yeah, do one with the sodium percarbonate. So on this one, uh, we did the wood cleaner and the wood stripper, but we didn't do the eco cleaner just because I knew at a glance, it wasn't going to do the job. And this was, this was a heavier duty job than just the eco cleaner. Um, because it had, it had organic growth. Now, like I said, underestimated how much organic growth that fence had but still yeah as you guys are uh, watching here if you got any additional questions dropping them in the comments below we're scheduled to go for another 25 minutes so i'd be happy to have a uh, conversation revolving around a subject that you guys are interested in talking about um we could go down really whatever rabbit hole uh, you're interested in so upcoming let's talk about weeks that are coming up will you guys drop comments below let's look at uh, let's see here. Look at the calendar here. So the next couple of weeks we've got, so the 27th, two weeks from today, will be the Saturday after Thanksgiving. Um, still planning on coming, doing this live. I mean, it's we're going to be closed as a company Thursday and Friday, Thursday for the holiday, Friday, because we understand people are either traveling to family or they'll have family traveling in. Uh, so we'll go ahead and close those days as well um let's see oh so december the 4th we're we're likely not going to have a live because my daughter is performing in a christmas parade so the republic missouri christmas parade her band is playing or the she's in a middle school band so she'll be playing in that so we'll likely we're still waiting on hearing about timing but it's probably going to overlap when i should be doing this live so december 4th will probably be out uh let's see and then December 5th will definitely be off for Christmas. I think my wife would string me up if I uh, decided to come on here and try to do a live on Christmas Day. She probably would not appreciate that at all. Uh, but, yeah, then we've got, all right, so New Year's Day, we're probably also not going to have a live because we're having people over to the house for New Year's Eve. I will probably not be in any sort of shape to be hosting this the day after. Um, yeah. But then moving forward, the 15th, 22nd, 29th, we're here. We're wide open. We're starting off a new year. And, uh, yeah, so what? one thing I'm excited about is bringing more guests on. So as I said before, I we're working with DNJ Projects. I need to send them a scheduling link after this is over, uh, as long as Nathan Downs, or as well as Nathan Downs, get him a link. Uh, Matt Warner, I sent you a link, but if you need me to resend it to you, let me know. Uh, probably just seeing what dates work with the schedule. Totally fine. Uh, we're working on having some other guests on uh, that I'm pretty excited about. So we talk about we talk about book books I'm reading and books I'm interested in. We talk about Emith, Emith Revisited. We talk about Profit First, Profit First for Contractors. Different books, same methodology. Um, we also talk about. I'm looking at the screen now to see uh, who else we're talking to. Oh, talk about, uh, I want to bring someone on to talk about uh, PPP and EIDL, more specifically uh, their impact or uh, theoretically what their impact has been on the market as far as material availability. So with EIDL, more contractors have more money to spend on bringing in materials. Now, EIDL funding has, um, has some rules, has some strings attached. So as far as business expansion, so you can't, 
Uh, you can't go buy a new facility. Uh, you can't go buy additional trucks for your crews. You can't expand your fleet, um, but you can buy more material. So, because you're not typically you're not typically expanding when you buy bulk material, you're simply stocking up for the year to come. Uh, so, what impact has PPP? So, PPP was payroll protection program. Doesn't directly apply uh, apply to material purchases. However, uh, money that would have been spent on payroll may have been spent on materials. So. I'd like to bring on an expert in that field to talk about PPP and EIDL's effect on material availability. Do they have anything to do with the shortage that we're seeing right now? And everything from wood to steel, you know, steel and aluminum, the suppliers are talking about a shortage coming up probably first to second quarter of next year uh, for things such as chain link, ornamental iron, ornamental steel, that sort of thing. I'd like to get their input input on what's coming up for that as well uh, we're also let's see here yep matt warner talking about scaling when to scale also talk about company culture uh, i want to see if he's got any more gold nuggets that i could uh we could initiate here like i said we just bought the deep freezes so that we could bring in uh turkeys and hams for thanksgiving and christmas also bring in uh some beef so that as guys need you know need a little bit extra to get by or maybe they know someone that needs a little bit extra to get by we're gonna have a uh a deep freeze full of beef come and get it as you need it sort of thing uh, but i'd be interested to see uh see what else matt's got in that uh brain of his i'm interested to hear that so what else do we have i want to talk about cryptocurrency uh this is something something that i think applies more and more to every industry right so uh alternative methods of payment alternative alternative currencies to hold uh your capital in right so the us dollar with inflation might not be the best vehicle to hold capital in uh, maybe by possibly cryptocurrency uh, you can get into all the different coins right stable coins are coins that are pegged closely to a currency typically the u.s dollar uh, or you can get into utility coins coins that are actually used to do things on a network on on a blockchain so i'd like to have that discussion but i know about this much in an ocean of information about cryptocurrency so i'd like to bring a expert on in that regards also, we're going to start accepting cryptocurrency as a company. At Ozark Fence will start accepting cryptocurrency through a company called BitPay. So I have a feeling um, once we get set up with them, see what the process is like, I'd like to share that process with you guys. Uh, if you guys are interested in accepting cryptocurrency, what that looks like. Uh, right now, we're going through the process. So I had submitted our information. They want a little bit of financial information. Who are you? What do you do? What kind of volume do you use? What use cases do you see? They want interesting question is are you wanting to pay bills in cryptocurrency which i don't know i mean if bitpay is pretty unique in that you don't get paid out you don't have to get paid out in the currency being paid with so if we had a client paying us in ethereum that we don't necessarily accept the ethereum so what bitpay does is bitpay converts it instantaneously from Ethereum to whatever we want to accept it in. Fiat currency, such as the US dollar, uh, or other cryptocurrencies. So one thing, one idea we're playing with after talking to others that are accepting it is to um, to convert it instantaneously to say 90% uh, currency, US dollars, 10% cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, Ethereum, whatever. You know, whatever we want to accept and then so what we would be doing is accepting our profit in cryptocurrency. Profit typically just sits in an account, waits for us to use it for whatever it is we want. You know, right now we just invested significant six-figure amounts into um, bringing on additional materials. But yeah, so putting our profit into uh, into the cryptocurrency market because right now there's some money there. You know, so we... Uh, I think I'm supposed to say right now that this is not financial advice. Do not take this as financial advice. I'm not a financial advisor. I'm a fence guy that's kind of messing around with stuff. So, but there's some money in cryptocurrency. 
So, so far today, you know, Bitcoin's up a percent, but when you start looking at the month, you know, it's up 15.27%. So 15% on the year, it's up 300%. So, you know, Bitcoin's the big one. Bitcoin's the one everyone knows. Um, what else? Just kind of going through my portfolio here. So we've also got uh, Cardano. It's something I've been kind of playing with a little bit lately. Um, now, now, see, here's a dangerous part. Cardano's down about 3% on the month. It's up 1,800% on the year. So uh, a little bit of a little bit of a gamble. However, um, I think it's a good idea to diversify in general, right? So uh, this is kind of an idea about diversifying what vehicles we hold capital in. Most everyone holds their capital in U.S. dollars, um, which are is pretty stable for the most part. However, <clears throat> we've been printing a lot of it. We, the royal we, for the government, right? And the the Federal Reserve has been printing money uh, like it's going out of style. And it's not backed by anything, not backed by gold for quite a while. So um, is there a better vehicle to hold that capital in? I think probably so. Anyway, so uh, we'll be talking to, I'd like to talk, talk to, once we get set up with BitPay, have someone on from BitPay to talk about what that process was like, uh, what are the advantages, how does it work, what fees are involved, all of that. BitPay seems to make it pretty simple to transact because it's instantaneous and it doesn't leave us holding 100% of the cryptocurrency for us to go try to exchange, usually for a fee, uh, to get back into US dollars so that we can pay our overhead and our cost in US dollars. Uh, I'd like to have them on. Also, I want to do a recap on the training event that we had. So right now, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, so right now we are putting together a recap video, like a montage type video of the training event. I'd like to, once we get that together, have Caleb and the other presenters on and just kind of do a recap. What happened, maybe do some reactions to the montage video. I see if that sparks up some conversation with us. I'd like to recap the training event. I think it went incredibly well. For those of you that joined in with us, thank you. I really had a great time. I hope you did as well. Um, the guys and gals I talked to that were here seemed to be pretty positive about the impact. I'd really be interested to hear about the impact that it had on you once you got back home. Were you able to implement uh, some of what we talked about, some of what we trained on? Ultimately, that's where the value is, right? So if you could take something home and implement it and and take advantage of it in the short term, tremendously valuable. So I'd like to hear some success stories on that if there's if there's any out there, which I already know of a couple. So anyway. Well, it's got a question. Does a cleaner do the cleaners remove the graying of cedar? In the Denver market, we do not get organic growth or any sort of fences, just a fading gray color. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, fading gray would be what you would use like a percarbonate or or a weak wood cleaner solution on, uh, followed up by the wood brightener. Uh, it depends, right? It's, it's probably going to depend on how old that wood is, of course. But <coughs> a percarbonate or a, or a weak wood cleaner, a light wood cleaner solution uh, would probably be a great choice, would bring a lot of that life back to the board before you stain it. Now, if we clean it and we don't stain it, it goes back to gray. It's all about it's all about UV damage. So, uh, but do they remove the graying? They can absolutely, depending on again the age of the fence. So, uh, the fence out here was every bit of twenty or twenty five years old. So there wasn't a lot of life left in it. Now, when it got wet, you could see some life left in it. But once it dried again, it got it went back. Uh, it had it'd be good to go show you guys what that fence looks like. But dragging all this stuff outside is probably not going to happen today. Um, it went back more towards gray, but more like a silver, maybe. Uh, there's just not a lot, a lot of life left in those boards. They've been neglected for, like I said, 20, 25 years. Uh, most of the life of those boards has been used up as the UV damage goes pretty deep on the boards. So, but can it? Absolutely. Depends on the age. You guys, we've got a few more minutes left. Looks like we've got, oh, about 10 minutes left, 12 minutes left. Uh, on today's broadcast. If you guys have any last minute questions or comments, drop those in the comments below. Uh, as I said, it, you know, we've got some speakers coming on. I'm excited to bring on other experts, both in our industry and other industries. 
uh, to provide an opportunity for me to ask questions and learn, but also for you to ask questions and learn as well. That's my favorite part is both you and I, when we have speakers on, we're both in the learning seat, which I love a lot. I, I hope that uh, the questions I ask are questions that you might have, or maybe they're questions that you hadn't thought of yet, but that you find uh, helpful or educational, that sort of thing. Um, so I'm looking forward to having those those guys and gals on. Uh, also bringing on Rachel to talk about my salesman in more depth. Uh, maybe ask answer your guys' questions. Uh, they've got if you guys came to the training event, you you saw some uh, upcoming features that they will be rolling out. So maybe have Rachel on as well talk about those upcoming features uh, or some features maybe as they roll out, maybe would be a better idea. So, yep. And then we got some review videos coming up. Like I said, the DNJ project guys in the UK, I'm, I'm so excited to have them on, but we'll probably, probably what I want to do is do a paired up with your reaction video that did pretty well last time. It seemed like you guys really liked that to where we illustrated uh, their way of building fence in the UK. Now, I was informed in the comment section of those videos that that is but one way to install fence in the UK. That is not the only way to install fence in the UK. I get it. It's just like everywhere else. If you say there's one way of doing fence, there will be five guys that tell you that's the wrong way of doing the fence. There's a different way. There's a better way. Understood. Right? So, I love to illustrate their way of building fence because I think it is a high quality and long lasting solution. Is it the cheapest way of building fence? No, there's probably less expensive ways such as using wood posts. Same here in the States. There are less expensive ways of building fence, but there's always a trade-off. So for less expensive, typically you're going to have a conversation about lower quality fence as well, but I'd like to do a reaction video with their content with them on to get their feedback on the reactions, like an inception of an inception of a, like that whole thing. So uh, it's typically a good time. Jim says, Hey Joe, thanks for answering all my, my thanks for answering all my brother and my questions. We find the information invaluable. Stay safe and have a great week. You, you got it, Jim. I mean, that's why, that's why I do this is to try to provide as most valuable, as much valuable, the most value to you possible, the most provide the most value. That's what we're up to here, right? So I really feel like, uh, so the videos, the pre-recorded videos are obviously helpful, but they're me explaining something that I think is important to know. I think Q and a live Q and a is an important part of that because it gives you guys the opportunity, gives you guys the floor to ask your different questions that I may not have thought to answer or gives you the opportunity to ask follow-up questions on the answer. And I enjoy the heck out of this. I really enjoy interacting with you guys. So you're welcome. Thank you. Logan Albert asked, do we shut down during the winter? We do not. Uh, sometimes we find other things to do during the winter. So, uh, but here in Southwest Missouri, it typically, we don't typically have enough of a winter uh, to justify shutting down. Also, We've got bills. They come 12 months out of the year. This place has a mortgage. I got to pay year round. The lights got to stay on. The utility, yeah, the heat's got to stay on. We got to keep these bills paid. Also, our team members have bills that need to be paid. They've got rent and mortgage that comes every single month. So we do other things, right? Sorry for that noise. That's I need to top that off next time before we start this. So you don't always want to hear that. Anyway, so when we're not building fence, what do we do? Uh, we have a fabrication shop, so we can be fabricating gates that in standard sizes that we know we're going to need, you know, later on in the season um, or next season. We can square away inventory. So one of the things we've done lately is invested significantly in holding on to inventory, uh, fittings, typically steel. So uh, fittings, pipe and rail, uh, and wire. So square an inventory away making sure the yard squared away and organized in a way that's easy for us to access when we do get busy again. That way, you know, we keep efficiency up there. Also, we're going to be stocking uh, the fittings and inventory inside one of our uh, warehouses here, our workshop, a lower workshop area. If you've been through the tour, you know where I'm talking about, the lower workshop area. Um, yeah, we're going to build out racks. We're actually in the process now of receiving in those racks that we ordered two months ago. 
they're shipping them in in drips and drabs. Right now we got three out of 27. So uh, we're going to start building those out, holding, uh, you know, not holding on the inventory, just loading up the inventory on those racks, organizing it in a orderly manner. Um, yeah, so we've got inside stuff that can be done. You know, and we're still in the process of getting the offices and, you know, offices and conference room and the lower workshop areas squared away. We moved into this facility. Uh, we moved in in April or May. We bought it right around first of the year, actually end of last year, uh, at the, the last week in December last year. Uh, we didn't move in until April or May. We had some uh, renovations to do in the front offices. Anyway, we're still getting it where we want it to be. So we've got some studio projects I'd like to do in here. Um, so this wall here actually goes. So uh, this used to be, so there used to be a guy that lived here or uh, there was a guy that lived here. So this was actually his bedroom. And then he has a closet where we keep all of our equipment that we're not using to put this on. Like our on-site equipment stays back there. Uh, but behind me was the shower. I want to blow that out. I want to make this studio bigger. I'd like to have two sets so that uh, when I do sit down recorded content, I'm in a different space than when you guys see me on live. I'd like those to be two different sets. So we've got some winter projects. So do we shut down? We do not because both we as a company and we as a team have bills that come 12 months out of the year. I like to keep my guys gainfully employed. Um, so Actually, like I said, we're in the process of hiring right now. So we make a commitment to our guys that we're going to have, excuse me, sorry, a minimum of 30 hours a week through the out, through the winter, 30 hours a week through the winter, uh, typically 45 to 50 hours through the summer is what we plan on having the guys work. Um, yeah. If guys need hours, we also have a pre-staining shop uh, to where typically the plan is this winter, we're going to start pre-staining. We've got three main colors. We've got, uh, cedar tone we've, as a light. We've got chestnut as a medium and walnut as a dark. To start pre-staining a bunch of fence pickets as as guys need hours and gals need hours too. So as our team needs hours, we're going to keep stuff to do. Bo says, let's hear more about your company. How was How's your expansion gone? I've not checked in on a live in a few months. I remember it was a rough move and transition for you guys. It was. It You know, so the moving process was... And we were just moving next door, literally the same property. We just bought the property next to ours, dropped the fence, and moved everything over. I would argue that that is more drawn, is harder than moving across town because everything's right next door. So if we we're moving across town, we'd probably lease a couple trucks or rent a couple trucks. We'd probably hire on a moving crew to help us with our crews, load everything up, and take it across town, unload it be done well <laughs> since it's the same property that's not necessarily how it goes uh it's moving everything over in waves and and shifts and you know the office moved over the course of about a week now we did have one day where we moved the operations of the office over we had to switch the phones in a day that way we were down one day all the computers moved all the phones moved but all the stuff associated with running an office moved over in waves you know extra printer paper moved over extra marketing materials moved over in waves and we we're operating essentially out of two offices hey do we have it here no must be over there let's go get it there bring some of it back here for it was a mess uh the shop moved our fabrication shop moved it basically in the course of a week um and it always seemed like it was, do we have it? Nope, must be over there. So anyway, so yeah, it was tricky. Now, we're 100% moved. So we've been 100% moved for several months, and we're still kind of getting it exactly how we want it, which is we had anticipated that, to get 90% of the way and then figure out the 10% as we use it so that it's more usable. So we don't ever write anything in ink, right? Write it in pencil. That way you can erase it and change it later. Um, we're still working on building out. So we started uh, e-commerce. We started selling fence fittings online. OZFence.store. Shameless plug. If you need some fence fittings, check it out. Pretty good pricing. Um, but we're still in the process of building that out. That's actually the majority of my day-to-day -day right now 
is building out e-commerce, uh, figuring out what that process looks like, figuring out the shipping process, the shipping carriers. Uh, thanks to Caleb and Ashley, they connected me with their FedEx rep, who is connecting me with the FedEx rep here, who is stopping by next week to help figure out, really figure out the oddball stuff. So sh uh, shipping fittings isn't really a problem. You can just box those up and ship them. Um, but shipping the oddball stuff, the tension bars, the wire, top rail, top rails, even for half sticks is 10 and a half foot. That's a bit of a thing trying to ship that stuff across country. It's got to go freight. And then if it is freight, how is it packaged? And it's a whole thing. That's my day to day figuring it out. So I've got the team, Rachel and her team or Rachel, Sarah and her team. I'm sorry. I've got another sister that's Rachel. She's over at Springfield Public Schools building development. Sarah and her team are uh, doing a great job on the residential. My dad, Jim, and his team are doing a great job on the commercial, which frees me up to do marketing and advertising, also building out e-commerce. So that's kind of what that's kind of where that's kind of where it is. Um, I hope that answers your question, Bo. Uh, the expansion is going well. I think. I mean, anytime you grow, you have growing pains, right? So it's just figuring out what those growing pains are, how to minimize them and get past them, improve and move on. Project Metal still with us. What is up? Joe, I'd love to see a video of one of your crews install a fence from start to finish. If you haven't if you haven't got one already, we don't. So we'll work on it. And the reason I say that is uh, the guys are not as keen to being on video as, as I am. And the people here in general are not as keen to being on video as I am. So uh, still working on getting Sarah on the video you are comfortable in front of a camera. This is not natural to sit in an empty room with two big, well, three big lights shining on you, talking to a video camera in the middle of nothing. Feels kind of weird, but uh, we're working on it. So I would like to just to show that everywhere produces fence a little bit differently. It's on the board. We're trying to get everyone more comfortable with being on video, but great suggestion. Caleb says Colorado needs eco cleaner. All the water runs out of Colorado eco cleaner and our new eco brightener for the win. I am interested in hearing about eco brightener for sure. William Foster said would love to see the pre staining process sometimes. Absolutely. William. So we're, we're working on it. I say that a lot, I guess we're always working on something. We have a pre-stain dip tank here now. Uh, so we we pre-dip everything right now. It's version 1.0. Needs some work. But version 1.0 was basically our proof of concept. I've seen it work other places. I wanted to see it work here. So probably this winter, one of the projects we'll work on is building version 2.0 of the dip tank. This dip tank's really deep. It doesn't need to be that deep. It's also, it's version 1.0. We got some work to do. Uh, but yeah, I would love to show you guys the pre-staining process because for whatever reason, like in the staining industry, it seems to be a secret. Like no one wants to talk about how they pre-stain. Cliff notes, it's pretty much all the same. You dip the boards in some stain, you hang it up to dry, drip dry usually. So everyone thinks they're holding on to the secret. The funny thing is their secrets are all pretty similar. It all looks pretty much the same. So, um, I'm excited to do that just to be the one that shows everyone what it looks like to pre stain fence pickets. It's really not that tough, but noted. We need to get that rolling. Well, it says, thank you, Caleb. We'll order some, give it a try. Refurbishing of fences is not a common service around here. Untapped market. So Bo, it's not here. So here in Southwest Missouri, it really isn't either. There's not a lot of people that do it. We've got, one, maybe two franchise. I say maybe two. There's one franchise here that they don't market very well. So I think they do. They they basically just show up at the home shows and show people what they do, but they don't actually market. So eh, we got another franchise that does market here, but not widely. So that's one thing we're finding. So the, the trouble there is when you have a market that hasn't been developed is how do you convince the market that that what you're doing is worthwhile. I mean, you know it is. You've seen it work. You understand the value there. How do you properly portray that value to your clients? That's something we're in the middle of doing right now. 
Um, that would be an interesting conversation too, Caleb, to have you on and talk about what it looks like to to you know build out a market that's not um, that that's not familiar with the value of cleaning, restoring, and then pre-staining, not pre-staining, staining a deck or a fence or something like that. Good idea. We're going to mark that one on the board. Jeremy, when you're watching this, let's put that one on the board. Hey, David's here. He says, hi, Joe. Sorry, just catching the end of your live. <laughs> Only just finishing work. You guys have been at it, Dave. So if I remember right, Six hours ahead, which means it is just about dinner time for you. Hope your day went super well. Uh, I was just telling the guys that we're working on, actually, I owe you a scheduling link to get scheduled to come back on. I also want to do a review video. I, I, I much enjoy doing a review video of your guys' work and seeing the comments uh, down below. Introducing, uh, you know, the North American viewers to the European method of building fence. And I also let them know that I... I learned in the chat or I was educated in the chat or in the comment section that that was not the only way of building fence in the UK uh, as, as if we didn't understand that everywhere in the world has about half a hundred ways of building a fence. But anyway, I, I look forward to doing another review video and then having you guys on to watch the review video and really just chat about, about how things are going there in the UK. I live vicariously through your videos. So anyway, I'm gonna I'm gonna get off my fanboy stage here, but I I enjoy watching your guys' content a lot. If you guys out there watching here, watching me here, haven't watched DNJ Project videos, do so. If you're watching on YouTube, let's see. Yes, there are, there are some of you, actually all of you watching right now are watching on YouTube. So in the search bar above, after this is over, uh, just type in DNJ Projects. You'll pick up. Uh, You'll pick up the David and Stevie's channel, DNJ Projects. You'll find them, and uh, or if you click on my channel's homepage, YouTube homepage, I've got all the channels I enjoy watching right there at the top. DNJ is on there. Click it, you'll find their stuff. I think you guys will find it incredibly, incredibly uh, entertaining. I love watching it. It's a day in the life series, so basically shows you what their day to day looks like. I find that incredibly interesting. So I think you guys will. I think you guys will as well. Uh, yeah. It sounds more awesome to me, Dave. Can't wait. Project Metal Music says, hey, Dave, love your channel and what you do. Agreed, agreed, agreed. All right, guys. Per usual, we are five minutes past, uh, past the ending time, past 1230. Uh, well, it depends, I guess, where in the world you're watching this from, but we're at two hours and 35 minutes. So about time to wrap this up. If you guys are watching this on a replay and if you have additional comments or questions, leave those in the comments below. It sends me a notification every time you guys comment. I love getting in there, replying to the comments, keeping up with you guys and what you guys have going on. I always love to hear from you. So uh, yeah, until next time, Joe Everest, the fence expert reminding you, that's right. Good fences make good neighbors. I'll see you guys next time.